Um, there's a worry. What was it? COVID-19. We know COVID-19 just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Well, now a laboratory has confirmed the first human case of avian influenza A H5N1 in the state of Texas in the USA. It's the second confirmed human case of influenza A H5N1 detected in the country. Do we have to be worried about that? And how do bird influenzas get into humans obviously I, I kind of feel like it's they just ate the bird right but apparently so that uh, humans aren't designed to fight avian flu and we will talk to dr mark chimes manager of the animal health and welfare project and veterinary advisor at milk south africa then after four o'clock today we get the latest of what happened down in the western cape huge storms and it's amazing i was there what two weeks ago and it was beautiful and then suddenly nature decided nah uh and we will get a, a couple of updates. We're going to talk to the Western Cape Disaster Management Center, get an update on what they are going through, mop-up operations in, in effect. But they're seeking more funds from national government to deal with some of the crises on the ground. And then we'll get a little bit more specific and talk to the fundraising and communications executive of, uh, of uh, how uh, from an animal shelter down in the Western Cape. They look after stranded animals. And that's obviously... There must be a lot of stranded animals, dogs and cats and, and, and other animals that have run away or, or, or left or changed their environment because of these big storms. And they're also looking for a little bit of money to be able to help them. And then in our election watch feature today, we talked to Bungani Ngomane, a PhD student at WITS. He penned an article about the things political parties promise and what they are selling and it's up to us to ask the right questions, which leads us nicely into the election monitor, which is coming up after five. So it's a busy show today. Let's take the national pulse. Across South Africa, online and on radio. SAFM, let's talk. Okay, numbers. Uh, I see somebody wants, or Jonah wants to know the numbers. So let's go through the numbers slowly. As always, you can give us a call. 86 2032 Lebo's on the phone today. He's desperate to take your calls. 86 2032 You can SMS 41391. That's going to cost you one round 50 though. But if you want to send a WhatsApp text or a voice note, you're more than welcome to do that as well. The WhatsApp number, put it in your phone. 0614-104-107. I'll say it again. 0614-104-107. And I also keep a, my left eye a little bit on X. I kind of see what's coming up there. You can find us at SAFM Radio. So let's get right into that. Uh, as always, phone lines are open all the time. But let's start with uh, big news that's happening out in... East, uh, the African National Congress's Dr. Klakaza has been elected as the new executive mayor of the city of Akurileni. You may recall the mayoral position was left vacant two weeks ago, and when um, the former mayor Ndongwana was removed in a vote of no confidence sponsored by Action SA. Let's go live to SABC News reporter Sashin Naidu now. Sashin, tell us a little bit more. I see uh, Dr. Klakaza has been talking to the media. What's he been saying? Hi, good afternoon. Yes, so uh, basically from our side, what happened uh, today was that Dr. Kakaza was actually uh, nominated unopposed during uh, today's extraordinary council meeting. And uh, he has actually uh, now been uh, sworn in as the new mayor of the city. So we do also see that, uh, you know, Fountain Premier Panyazala Sufi spoke to us a bit earlier as soon as this appointment was made. And uh, he has actually welcomed uh, Dr. Kakaza's appointment, saying that he is, in fact, confident that uh, the new mayor does, in fact, have the best interests of the municipality at heart. And he feels that he is, in fact, the best candidate for the position. What is the background of Dr. Kakaza, then? Well, uh, to be uh, precise, he was a MMC in the city of uh, in uh, the city of Ekuruleni, and he has actually been, uh, you know, a councillor in the municipality for quite some time now. And uh, also, we did hear from other political parties uh, here saying that, you know, they do also feel that he was in fact, uh, you know, the best person for this job because they feel that he knows all of uh, the issues in the city and he will actually serve it quite well and to the best of. Ability. It's been two weeks. Uh, have, have you been able to find out what the city has, how the city's been running over those two weeks? 
Yes, so that actually was also quite a bone of contention that the Premier uh, also spoke about earlier on today because, as you would know, uh, service delivery was in limbo for Mm. those two weeks. So he did say that, uh, you know, they have issued a notice to the city uh, stating that a mayoral committee must, in fact, be appointed as soon as possible just to ensure that uh, services are rendered uh, to the best of its ability in the city as soon as possible. Because we do know that there have been quite a number of issues, uh, you know, in and around this municipality. And uh, the Premier says that the only way for this to be resolved under Dr. Takaza's leadership is for a new uh, electoral committee to be uh, set up and for them to start working as soon as possible. Uh, A bit of a delay to the start of the council meeting, but how important is it that he was elected unopposed? It doesn't seem as if any other political parties uh, wanted to, or or it seems to me that other political parties wanted to get this over quickly and, and get somebody in that position. Yes, that is correct. So basically what happened is that due to the multi-party government that, uh, you know, is in the city of Ekuruleni, there were quite tough negotiations happening over the past two weeks in terms of them getting to uh, this conclusion to allow Dr. Kakaza to be appointed unopposed. So uh, according to the Premier, as well as other political parties, they said that you know, the negotiations were quite tough and they ensured that, uh, you know, everything was followed by the book to ensure that, uh, you know, the residents are in fact put forward and put first to ensure that service delivery is sorted out. And they believe that Dr. Kaza was in fact the best person to ensure these uh, responsibilities are fulfilled. All right, so it seems as if political parties working together to get something done. It's, 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 it's surprising. Yes, that is correct. So that was also, uh, you know, brought up because uh, many of the political parties said that, uh, you know, they have to now put politics aside. uh, And the main thing that uh, they wanted was for, um, you know, the services in the city to be rendered efficiently uh, as possible. So that was the reason why, you know, they had to set their differences aside just to ensure that uh, the residents get the best possible services. SABC News reporter Sashin Naidu, thanks very much. SAFM, setting the nationwide agenda daily. Daily. John Kerik in for Ashraf. It's 16 minutes past three. Now, scores of learners and parents in Funderbell Park in the Val area have been left stranded after Barrage Primary Farm School gates were closed down last week. The landlord, Martin Dupre, closed down the institution after claims that the school was built on his land. The Gauteng Department of Education is five months in arrears of the lease amount. The Education Department says it's working around the clock to resolve the matter. Uh, Posedletso Makwena filed this report. Hundreds of learners at Barras Primary Farm School in Vanderbilt Park in the Val area have been temporarily placed at a neighboring school. This after their school was closed down by Martin Dupree due to an outstanding lease amount owed by the Department of Education in Gauteng. A parent of one of the affected learners, Lindy Wezolingana, expressed her frustrations. I'm stressed about the fact that these children will end up doing bad things since they have not been going to school. This is not right. The school has been here the longest time. I do not understand why we are only experiencing this issue now. The department should just fix this matter. Community leader Sarah Mangai says she is concerned about learners that rely on school's feeding scheme for their daily meal. What worries me the most is that these children who are not going to school are from very poor families as we are staying in rural. Some of them are not having enough because the parents are not working so they don't even have enough food to eat from home so they are depending to eat from school so if they are not going to school where are they getting their daily meal the department of education in Gauteng confirms that there was a delay in the payment due to administrative processes however they are finalizing to pay dupree three months in advance the department spokesperson Steve Mabona says this matter will be resolved by next week. In other instances, we have an arrangement to pay a, a year uh, so that then we don't have challenges where we'll be having you know, challenges like this where we then are running around because there were delays on you know, issuing a, a purchase order. 
uh, which is regrettable. But we are taking those learners in the neighboring school, which we've agreed with that school, in the interim, while we are resolving the issue with the landlord, um, to make sure that the learners are not disadvantaged as far as curriculum delivery is concerned. SABC News made a call to the landowner Dubri, who initially agreed to comment, but later ignored the attempts made to set up an interview. For SABC News, I am Busele Zomogwena. SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide. Two years since winning the EFC middleweight title in the most dramatic and controversial fashion, Luke Michael finally defends his belt for the very first time at EFC 112 against the imposing submission machine J.P. Kruger. And in the co-main event, featherweight champion Iga Smiley Cabessa becomes the next athlete aiming for champ champ status as he battles the imposing Kaleka Block Cabanda. EFC 112 live this Thursday. Watch it on SABC Sport Channel on DTT Channel 4 from 7 p.m. Brought to you by SABC Sport. stories that warm your heart and ignite your spirit every morning on Expresso. Do you know a young hero making waves in your community? We want to hear from you. Share their inspiring stories with us on our WhatsApp line 063-408-8863 and let's celebrate their achievements together. And here's the best part. You could join us live in studio to tell your story. Expresso Morning Show, every weekday morning at 6 to 9 a.m. only on S3. You are listening to John Gerica on SFM. European Union lawmakers have passed a landmark asylum and migration pact that's aimed at managing the impact of migration in Europe. After almost 10 years of negotiations, the reforms stipulate that people could be rejected for asylum if they can be sent to a third country deemed safe. There's a lot more to this as well. Musa Ndunge is a political analyst and PhD candidate at the University of Dundee in Scotland. Uh, Musa, afternoon to you. Thanks very much for joining us. This is going to change the way asylum seekers are, I, I guess, also spread around Europe. There's that spreading agreement. Tell us a little bit more about it. Thank you so much for having me and good afternoon to your listeners. So certainly, you know, the EU has been seized with this matter since 2016. Um, In fact, last year, the continent saw about 380,000 people illegally crossing into the EU. And this has been quite a seismic challenge for the EU, particularly for frontline states, whether we think of the likes of Italy, whether we think Spain, whether we think Greece, and to an extent even Turkey, as much as it is not a member of the EU explicitly at this moment. Um, So these are the kind of things that they've been battling, given domestic pressures from their own electorate, both from the far right as well as the far left. There's been quite a critique about the manner in which the EU deals with issues around migration. This speaks to limited resources within these countries. And of course, if you think about the past, say, 10 years, you know, given, number one, the 2008 uh, global recession, and then you had the European sovereign debt crisis. These are countries that have been under pressure economically to provide for the needs of their own countrymen. And so the added pressure, added by a flow of migration, both from Africa and from the Middle East, has added pressure and has increased the need for these countries to find each other in terms of a continental agreement on how to deal Mm. with the migration challenge in Europe currently. All right, so as you said, these frontline countries, so people from Africa hitting Spain and Italy and Greece, uh, Eastern Europe obviously getting the the Eastern Europeans and and, and, and people from the East coming in. This now, the first thing that stuck out to me is all 27 countries will either take in migrants from frontline countries or give supply extra funding to those frontline countries. Yes, certainly. That is the agreement as it is now. And that is the kind of compromise that has been struck here to say if if the frontline states, especially those in, in South Europe, are to be the ones that will be the, that will bear most pressure mm. in terms of the acceptance of my, of migrants and refugees in those countries, then it is fair that countries such as Germany or Austria's that would receive far less at this point would have to then cough up and pay their fair share. 
Um, though there is still a, a, some pushback in terms of this agreement, especially from countries such as Poland, which is pushing back on that element of having to pay part of, of the money that is going in to support the, these, these migration deals. But, you know, for now, it looks like the fact that nobody is happy at this point, then it looks like it's a deal that is likely to stick uh, unless there will be any litigations brought forth um, to challenge the legality of such a move, particularly on the grounds of human rights. That may be the particular challenge that these states face. And if that is mitigated, then, you know, it looks like for now they would have resolved this crisis. Explain to me, there's obviously a difference between an immigrant and an asylum seeker. Are there special rules and regulations in this agreement for asylum seekers? Well, certainly for asylum seekers, look, the move really is is to try and find a third country, a third party country that would be able to house asylum seekers. So, for so I'll give you, uh, you know, a good example, right? So, in countries where we know issues around, you know, uh, uh, homosexuality, the rights of the rights of, of of the LGBTQ are not observed in countries like that you'll find that you'll have asylum seekers will apply to countries like Italy, UK, and so forth. And these countries do have an obligation, I may add, to process the asylum application of these particular individuals. They are bound by international law and convention. And that's really where the challenge has been and why this has been such a hot but issue in Europe. To say, given these international obligations, what is the best way forward? to deal with an increase of asylum seekers, whether it be from terrorist hit countries or countries of a poor human rights record, how best to deal with this. That is why we saw what happened in terms of the UK case, its agreement with Rwanda being flagged as really being going against the spirit of human rights and the obligations that the United Kingdom Mm. has in terms of asylum seekers. So this is really why we see this issue getting so much airtime, because it speaks to the obligation that states have towards other people coming into their country for such reasons. And given that we are spotlighting Europe as the supposed vanguard of international conventions and human rights, it's interesting You see, these countries almost negate this responsibility, trying to push it towards third world countries. And that's the challenge with the deal. One of the things they need to they need to speed up this asylum requests. They say they've got a maximum of 12 weeks. The countries do to to deal with asylum requests. So you're not going to have asylum seekers sitting in in, in tents and camps for for months on end. Certainly, you know, th- that that speaks to, to the issue of, of human rights as it relates to the conditions that asylum seekers find themselves in with, within these countries. So in other words, it's, it's, it's ensuring that as you, ha- as you house these people, that you are able to, to ensure that you meet your obligation in terms of international convention. And that is why you need to speed up the processes in which you, you, you process asylum seekers. But it also then speaks to the greater sort of issue here around how European countries exercise their foreign policy or on how they then in, intervene in, in countries that are that are facing huge challenges that would result in such a flux, influx of asylum seekers and refugees in their countries. So again, there's an indictment to the international global system as we see it today, the very fact that you have a flow of, of, of people moving away from countries that in actual fact are well resourced, should be able to provide for their people. But because of issues such as war, famine, conflict, terrorism, these countries are not functioning. Mm. And what does it say about the kind of support that European countries then provide for these countries? In other words, you can't be complaining about asylum seekers but propping up the dictators. And that's the contradiction here among the Europeans, as I see it. Uh, You you mentioned earlier a couple of states that are against this. Uh, Hungary has vowed not to take any irregular migrants, quote, regardless of any migration pact. Polish prime ministers rejected as unacceptable the mechanism of taking in asylum seekers or paying the EU. Uh, Do you see this going ahead when you've got those big countries saying, no, this is actually a bad idea? 
certainly it is a challenge because obviously each country has a veto right to any sort of resolution that would be undertaken by the eu but i would imagine then this is the way uh, diplomacy will have to play a huge role here so the likes of emmanuel macron you know will have to will have to meet these leaders the likes of the german chancellor and what is likely to, 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 to happen is the Western sort of European countries, such as Netherlands, Germany, such as France, are likely going to have to put more in the pot mm. uh, in order to subsidize the complaints that are being received from the likes of Poland, from the likes of Hungary. And so I think in, in this case, diplomacy and money are likely to win the day because some sort of a resolution has to has to be found here yeah. and remember this is happening within a bigger sort of conflict in the european union around the russia ukraine war whether to give more military aid who who, who, who how do you distribute that responsibility so in other words what we are seeing here is that is is, is is a debate around the distribution of responsibility among European powers between the West and the East, the Northern states and the Southern states, and the rich and the poor. And as long as these countries cannot find each other, mm. then the European project remains at risk. All right. Musa Mdunge, thank you very much. Political analyst and PhD candidate based at the University of Dundee in Scotland with his views. The one thing that uh, I didn't realize right at the end of this little press release or this article that I've got here is you, you would think that this quick turnaround of asylum seekers would be a good thing. They've got to do it within a maximum of 12 weeks. But I see that NGOs of asylum seekers say that uh, it lowers the chance of being accepted as an asylum seeker. So they will then, the asylum seekers, will go to small border islands or detain, and uh, they will go to smaller places in frontline states and have less access to fair, fair procedures. There's just less staff that can look into their, their requests. It's also worried, says the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, they're worried that the normalization of detention and speedier processes at borders could lead to sending people back who should be granted asylum. So there's a lot more to this than meets the eye at first glance. You with SAFM, it's exactly half past three. Let's get the latest news headlines with Eva Chippa. Thanks, Ashraf. Top stories for this hour. Action SA in Ekuruleni says it will ensure that they continue to be an effective opposition and hold the new mayor of the city, Nkosindi Pile Kagaza, accountable so that the residents receive the best service delivery as possible. Earlier today, Kagaza was nominated and opposed during an extraordinary council meeting. In other news, MK leader Jacob Zuma has accused the country's courts of being biased. Zuma says this is because President Sil Ramaphosa was not in court today despite the private prosecution case against him in the Johannesburg High Court. And lastly, more convicted murderers of the Collins Chabani mayor Moses Maluleke have asked the High Court in Polokwane Limpopo to be lenient when sentencing them. I have more on these and other stories at 4. For SFM News, I'm Eva Chipa. AFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Quite heavy on the N1 through Mid Rand, driving south today. It's a breakdown at Bacluse, so already traffic parking back through to Allendale Road. Two sets of roadworks on your way from Pretoria to the airport. The first lot at uh, Clayville, uh, the second lot between Bobsontain and the Benoni exits, and there are delays uh, coming through both of those areas. Uh, the N12 eastbound coming through Dibcliffe Interchange, a crash at Uncle Charlie, so it's quite a heavy backlog uh, to work through there as you come through Dibcliffe Interchange and, and go towards Alberton, if you like. Uh, but just coming up through that, uh, Mike One is where the crashes. Uh, Durban Spaghetti Junction uh, is a mess today. There's some heavy traffic coming south on the N2 into roadworks approaching Spaghetti Junction. That queue back through Inunda Road. Uh, northbound, a collision scene between Spaghetti Junction and Umgeta Road. So the N2 north is heavy. N3 outbound, backlogging into that N2 from as far as Sherwood. Uh, N3 inbound, backlogging from Pavilion past a breakdown and then struggling through Spaghetti into that N2 crash delay. Also some delays on Umgeta Road outbound at Springfield. M3 13 from Kloof moving through to Gillets. If you're on your way to Hillcrest, there's a delay today. And Cape Town, uh, not a bad run through the traffic, not a bad start, at least just the uh, standout really being the M7 south at Milton in Goodwood. Looks like the traffic lights are down there. If you're on your way to Four Trekker Road, Jake's Kerbell Drive is quite slow getting through that junction. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. This is SAFM Sports with Duming Kabele. Tumi Hazard. 
Good, thanks. How are you, John? Look, man, I just want to tell a quick story. You came in yeah. this afternoon, right? Yeah. So now I did sports with uh, with Udo for uh, midday earlier on. And you came in and said, John, you know from rugby, can you explain to me the difference between what the Bulls are playing now and what the Sharks are playing? And, and, like, and I was like to me, I, I don't know. I, Too I, many competitions. I don't know. There's Super Rugby. There's Curry Cup. There's okay, Champions so Cup. Super Rugby, I got. That's the ones in, in New Zealand. Yes. Right? So they do their thing. Yeah. Then you've got? Curry Cup. Okay, that's coming up. Champions Cup. Champions Cup. Yeah. Okay. Then the EPCR, the European Professional... CR. CR Cup. Okay. Champions Cup. The URC. Or Challenge Cup, rather. Challenge Cup. Yeah. It? The URC, yeah. United the URC. Rugby Championship. Yes. And that... What's that? Also, there's going to be a, a Rugby Club World Cup coming up. Okay, there's Varsity Cup Rugby being played Varsity as well. Varsity Cup Rugby also. All right, and then there's all the international competitions that have that. Okay. If you understand it, give us a call. Explain <laughs> it to us, please. To me. Alrighty, let's start things off with Nepal this hour. The Telcom Nepal League is back and this time around the action will be in Johannesburg. The Ellis Park Arena will be this year's host venue following an agreement between the city of Johannesburg and Nepal South Africa. So usually the competition plays in Pretoria. Last season it was in Limpopo and this time around it's in Josie Maboning. And uh, this year the tournament will have 16 teams competing with the Northwest Chukudu being the latest team to be added to the league. And Nepal's South Africa President Cecilia Mulugwane says that the expansion of the Telkom Nepal League is a statement to the vast talent of the sport in the country. Then in golf, there's a delay to the start of the Masters that has happened being due to the bad weather at the Augusta National. The 88th edition of the Masters will see Spaniard John Rahm defending his green jacket, while world number one Scotty Scheffler is a strong candidate to win the second term or his second one. And Rory McIlroy is still searching for his his first Masters victory and five-time winner Tiger Woods says that uh, he's capable of winning despite recent injury struggles. So only time will tell if he'll be able to do it. He's not. <laughs> he's not able to get it. Anything is possible. No, John. it's not. Tiger Woods will not win the Masters. How much money you got? Come on. <laughs> no, I'm not willing to put money on Tiger Woods. <laughs> However, anything is possible. In football, after missing out on the inaugural calling knockout trophy, TS Galaxy head coach Siet Ramovic says that uh, their big goal now is uh, to win the Nepal Cup. Ramovic and his troops will be uh, driving down to Mbombela again this weekend where they meet Chippa United in the Guiana quarterfinal on Sunday afternoon. Now, in December, the Rockets lost out their second ever cup title when Stellenbosch FC pipped them in the CKO final on penalties. But uh, in the second round of the season, and uh, Ramovic says that this time around his team is going all the way. I could do it in an easy way and say it. our goal is to stay in the league and our goal is to maybe uh, go to the quarter final and we are happy. No, we are not. We want to be in the top eight spot for this season. We want to come so far as uh, uh, possible. Of course, our dream is to win the cup and we know that we can do it. But we all also know if we don't put 100% on the field from Monday until the Friday, not on the game time, from in the training, in the training weeks is the most important thing. This is where you win the games. And if we don't put the intense, if we don't have this kind of high level intensity practice every day, then the game will be a very tricky one. And if you do it every day in the, at the training, then the game will be easier for the players. And this is well, elsewhere, Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp has uh, issued a plea for fans protesting against uh, ticket prices to support the team against Italians Atlanta in uh, the Europa League quarterfinal first leg today. A supporters group announced that uh, there would be no flags in uh, the cup end for the game in protest against the club's decision to increase the price of tickets. But Klopp said that he understood the fans' discontent. We are a self-sustaining club, we have to, as long as I'm here, I, I can tell everybody each pound we earned went directly back into football. That was always the case, so it's not wasted for something, it's um, for the club is doing, for the community, all these kind of things. There's a lot of good things what you could say what the club is doing, but I understand 100% where the, where the supporters are coming from. Um, and I'm pretty sure they will find they will find a solution in these situations. It's um, it starts with a, maybe a protest and then they need follow discussions um, and that's good. But what we should make sure 
that we don't that, it, that it's that there's nothing what gets between us and and the supporters. It just, just should not happen. Look, discuss it. Yes, you are not happy with it. Talk. 100% should happen, uh, but in between the two big whistles. We just have to be Liverpool, um, and that's what I'm asking for. In rugby, the Bulls and the Sharks will try to advance to the Champions Cup and the EPCR Challenge Cup semifinals, respectively, for the first time this weekend. The Sharks will uh, take to the field first against Edinburgh at uh, Kings Park in the Challenge Cup quarterfinals on Saturday, while the Bulls take on Northampton Saints in England following their comprehensive win against Lyon. Now, the Bulls will face a formidable force in the Saints, who are unbeaten in the competition this season and currently top the Premiership table with 10 victories in their 14 matches. Anything's off with tennis. Former world number one Daniil Medvedev has uh, crashed out of the Monte Carlo following a 6-3 and 7-5 defeat to Karen Kachanov. And this win sees Kachanov reach the last eight in Monte Carlo for the first time. On that note, it's a wrap from my side for now. I'll have more in the next hour for SAFM Sport. I'm Dumin Kapele. You're talking ticket prices with Liverpool, right? There's yeah. a, One of the news sites is asking how much would you be prepared to pay for a ticket to watch the Springboks play the All Blacks at Ellis Park or Cape Town Stadium this year. So they've they've got from zero to two hundred, two to five hundred, five hundred to eight hundred, eight hundred to fifteen hundred, fifteen hundred to two and a half thousand. So you know there are two and a half thousand rand tickets yeah. to watch the All Blacks. The majority, thirty three percent, are saying zero to two hundred bucks. Sure. So that's what people want to pay for these tickets. But yeah, so I think they start at two hundred and fifty bucks to watch New Zealand play the Springboks. I think a lot of people wouldn't mind playing a lot. I think you get good value. 250 rand's not bad to watch the world champions. But if those tickets are sold out then and there's like 2,500, you wouldn't pay 2,500 pay to go watch the Springboks play the All Blacks? See, I'd, 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 I've never seen it live. It's one of my dreams in life to see the Springboks play the All Blacks. But would I pay 2,500 rand? I I'm, think it's worth it. It's got to be a good seat for 2,500 bucks. I don't want to sit with the riffraff. <laughs> Timmy's back with more sport in an hour. SAFM 104 to 107 nationwide. Mummy Lodi Sundowns ladies believe they belong at the top and they want the vital three points. But Linda Lani ladies are on a mission to shock Banyana Bas style. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the queens of the beautiful game. Mummy Lodi Sundowns ladies FC versus Linda Lani ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 11 a.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. And we would buy 500 cars and we would buy 500 more. So sell your car for the best price and we won't think about it twice. We buy cars, we buy cars. The easiest way to sell your car by far. Last year, the Mars Singer hit South Africa like a storm. This year, the Mars Singer South Africa returns with 16 huge celebrities hidden behind 16 humongous masks. Get ready to be amazed and astonished with brand new masks and performances that are going to blow your mind. Don't miss the biggest television event since <laughs> season one. The Mars Singer South Africa season two premieres on S3 Saturday, 6 April at 6.30 p.m. Conversations that you connect with and react to. SAFM. It's a great tweet from uh, Black Pride, Vukaning Koba19 on Twitter at the moment, replying to one of our tweets. Uh, I'll read that out later on. I think it's clever, very clever, Black Pride. Well done. Uh, you with SAFM, John in for Ashraf. It is the National Pulse. It's 18 minutes to 4 o'clock. Coming up in a moment, the United States has notified World Health Organization of a laboratory confirmed human case of avian influenza. It's number, eight, eight, number A, H5N1.
in Texas. That's in a moment. But first of all, Section 27 has welcomed the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment in a corporal punishment case against the South African Council of Educators. Two teachers meted out corporal punishment against two primary school pupils in the classroom. The court dismissed the review application on technical grounds, but agreed that the SACE's internal policy must be revised. Let's find out a little bit more. It's quite technical. With Farinaz Viriava, Head of Educational Rights Program at Section 27. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just want to understand what, what these two teachers did that we're talking about particularly here. When, when I read what they did, I don't think we can call it corporal punishment. This was genuine assault. Yes, it was definitely a uh, genuine assault. And that is the thing that Section 27 and many other public interest organizations have it, are having to address for many years now. Mm. We are seeing a pro, you know, an increase in violence in schools, whether it's sexual violence or whether it's corporal punishment. And corporal punishment has been outlawed since uh, 1996. But despite that, and despite two constitutional um, court judgments, we're still seeing a lot of uh, corporal punishment. So what this case is trying to do is that we have, protocols in place to deal with corporal punishment. And we have organizations like the South African Council for Educators to deal with things like sexual violence and corporal punishment. However, what we find is that not enough is being done by these institutions, and not just them, but you know other institutions as well that have similar powers, to enforce the ban. So what we did a few years ago was, uh, because we think that these two cases, look, these are young children. People say that um, the kind of violence we've seen now perpetrated by teenagers in schools is because of corporal punishment. That is not true. It's because of the corporal punishment ban. That is not true. These were young kids. What they suffered, as you rightly said, was assault. We then went to the high court and said that the sanctions that the teachers got were identical, even though they, the actual assaults were different. And the one actually went into hospital and threatened the learner when the learner was in school. Mm. So the sanctions were inappropriate. They give standard cookie-cutter sentences, which are suspended uh, removal from the roles of educators and a small fine. Mm. And we said... Um, You know, you have to take into account what is in the best interest of the learner and whether you can put a teacher back into the classroom immediately after something like this, where you are beating in, where you are beating up a seven year old child with the PVC pipe. There's, you know, you need to look at some serious kind of remedial action to correct the behavior or to just make sure other kids are protected. Um, And we asked for the safe rules to be changed. At a high court level, we got the one, which was getting the rules changed, but not, we asked for the teacher sentence to go back to safe. We didn't get that, so we appealed to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And we got a wonderful, wonderful judgment from the Supreme Court of Appeal. Okay, just before you go on, the, the first thing that will happen, Farinaz, is somebody's going to message us to say, oh, well, I was caned as a child and I'm a better person yes. because of it. Uh, this is These particular cases we're talking about, and I, we'll talk about the caning in a bit, th- this wasn't a caning. This was uh, the, the pupil or the learner was allegedly ha- um, hit with a PVC pipe on the head with brain hemorrhages, and the second one assaulted by hitting her on the head and on the cheek. She bled from the ear, taken for several medical examinations, admitted to hospital twice. So there's a big difference that we're talking about here. But when I hear that, Farinaz, and and then you tell me that they were suspended and they were given a 15,000 rand fine, of which 5,000 were suspended. They had a suspended sentence. They weren't even suspended. Why did did it go further than that? Did they face criminal case from by the police? Well, charges lay. No, none of that. They were, in effect, back in the classroom after these incidents. Now, to be clear, even caning is no longer allowed. Yes. But what is supposed to happen 
is that teachers, look, we also know that teachers have huge classrooms and are dealing with discipline issues and all of that. What needs to happen is that there are all sorts of alternative forms of discipline that teachers could be trained in but aren't being trained in, being taught how to manage classes better and to do a whole lot of things. Obviously, where a learner perpetrates a criminal act, there are a whole lot of other routes for learners to uh, be um, removed from the class classroom and even to face criminal processes depending on the age and all sorts of things. But in this instance particularly, you can't, you can't where a learner is assaulted with a PVC pipe and in hospital and is threatened in hospital, treat that, le- that teacher sentence in the same way you'll, you'll, you'll discipline a teacher for a simple caning. Mm, mm. Um, you know, and that's what we're trying to do. So what the, what the Supreme Court of Appeal did, which another advocate friend of mine noted was a very excellent thing to do, is that when we come to government institutions in our current day and age, for the first time in a long time, the Supreme Court, not not necessarily the Supreme Court, but the courts are saying themselves, there are various duties that an institution like faith has to abide by. They have a duty to ensure whenever they sanction a learner, whenever they sanction a teacher, They have to have a duty to ensure that what will that teacher, would it be safe for the learners to go back into the classroom? What is the best way? What is the best way to address the underlying reason for whatever the teacher or the educator did? Mm. So I think SAFE is going to have to go back to the drawing board. I know they have resource constraints. I think Parliament has to take this into effect. Um, and they really have to go back to the drawing board and to teach and, and to treat every single case that comes before it according to the facts. So that you're putting the interests of the children first, not just meeting out these cookie crunch um, sentences. Yeah, Constitution says the best interest of the child be of paramount importance in proceedings affecting children. It's, it seems basic, but obviously it's not being enforced and things have to change soon. Exactly. Faranaz Variava, thank you very much. Head of Education Rights Program at Section 27. Channel your inner adventurer on Top Travel this Saturday night at 8.30 on S3 as Fez and Anesu are in Limpopo for tea with a rooibos-loving hippo named Jessica. Jumping off Graskop Gorge in Pomalanga, Fez screams from the top all the way to the bottom. But standing at God's window will leave anyone speechless. That's Top Travel this Saturday night at 8.30. Repeat Sunday at 1 p.m. on S3. The boys of Steve Parker resist to leave the pitch without a ticket to the semis. But there's a big problem. Kevin Hunt's boys say the last dance of happiness belongs to them. This is the Netbank Cup quarterfinal battle. Stellies versus Matatans Apitori on Saturday, 13 April at 2.30 p.m. Live on SABC1 and SABC radio stations. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. You are listening to John Gerica on SFM. Nine minutes to four. John in for Ashraf for the National Pulse. You can give us a call. What do you make of all of uh, spoken about so far? 86 2032 We'll take some voice notes in a bit and read some of your messages as well. So stay close for that. 86 2032 if you want to phone. Voice notes 0614-104-107. Uh, somebody, one of the, the, the staff of the controllers at Ares here where I was working in the afternoon had his mask on. He's got to, he's not feeling well and then i see this story and i'm starting to worry the united states has notified the world health organization of a laboratory confirmed human case of avian influenza a h5n1 detected in texas uh, second confirmed human case of that influenza detected in the country it appears to be the first human infection with h5n1 acquired from contact with an infected mammal 
although human infections with other influenza subtypes have previously been acquired from mammals. To give us more, exp- uh, sorry, from a bird, we'll find out a little bit more about this. Let's find out the health risks associated with this and uh, from avian flus as well. We're joined by Dr. Mark Chimes, manager of the Animal Health and Welfare Project and veterinary advisor at Milk South Africa. Dr. Mark Chimes, thank you very much for joining us. Is this something that we need to worry about, AH5N1? Uh, good afternoon, John and, and listeners. Um, no, at this stage, certainly nothing to be concerned about yet. Um, to say we, we sh- we're following the situation with interest, um, but at this stage, it doesn't seem to be holding any danger for, for humans. All right, avian influenza viruses. We, we seem to have one of these pop up. I want to say almost every year there's some sort of H something, N something that comes up. Why, why do these happen? Um, there are several uh, families or, or genuses or whatever of uh, avian influenza, uh, or influenza, sorry. And uh, the H1 and H3 influenza types are the ones that generally circulate in the human population. So they don't have pandemic uh, potential so much anymore, even though it causes little flu epidemics now and again, because uh, the human population has immunity against it. So the virus can't spread that easily. But when it comes to the H5 and the H7 strains, um, the human population is naive, meaning we don't have much immunity against it. And if those should spread from birds or pigs to humans, uh, then you have a massive spread of, of uh, influenza and it's potentially quite dangerous. Uh, first of all, let, let's talk about the animals. Is this a, a worry for America's bird life? Um, no. Um, yes and no. Uh, avian influenza occurs worldwide. I mean, we've got H5N1 in our wild bird populations in South Africa as well. Oh, okay. Um, that, that's what's been causing these outbreaks of bird flu that we hear about in the ostriches and in the poultry. Mm, mm. I, mean, I mean, in 2023... South Africa slaughtered more than 7,000, 7 million poultry sure. animals because of uh, bird flu outbreaks trying to stem the spread. Um, similar in America, they had some massive outbreaks in the last few years. Uh, the thing is, this H5N1 variant uh, seemed to be mutated in Europe in around about 2020, and from there it spread to America, South America, and Asia, uh, all across the world. Um, so, yeah, it, it's endemic. It occurs everywhere. We've been living with it for years uh, without very much problem. Uh, just not long enough for us not to have an immunity to it. Our, our immunity isn't uh, as fantastic as it could be, as you said, to the other ones. Yes. The reason is that um, the avian flu virus is not well adapted. It doesn't have the receptors mm-hmm. to, to infect mammals. Uh, it's very effective in, in, in infecting mammals or even spreading, and, and even more so for humans. And it would appear that the H5N1 that occurs in South Africa is even slightly less adapted to spread to mammals than the one that's been occurring uh, or that occurs in Europe and in the Americas. Um, in the Americas, they've been seeing infections in, in some wild mammals like uh, red foxes in Canada and sea lions in South America, bears in Canada, bobcats, ferrets, skunks, that kind of thing. Um, but it's not really managed to spread very far from, from that. It's, it's, it's the odd case that they might mm. up. Okay, so it, is, is this then the fact that there is now a human infection of this? Is, is that an extremely rare situation that uh, there, are, there have been two cases that have been found? Or is this something that you guys as, as animal health and welfare vets and things start, your ears start pricking up a little? Well, whenever they spill over of, of bird flu from birds to mammals, then it picks up it picks our ears. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're scared that it might mutate in these mammals and might make it more easier yes. to spread in humans than that. But in humans, it's actually quite rare. In, in the last 20 years, we've had less than 900 cases of uh, H5N1 specifically uh, in humans worldwide. Um, but it's highly pathogenic. In, in the, of those 900 uh, cases, uh, nearly half of them died. Um, and, and what makes this particularly interesting is the fact that um, 
it's now gone into dairy cattle. I mean, um, cows don't have influenza viruses. Unlike if this was a, if this was in pigs, we'd be much much more concerned, right? Because they do have natural influenza viruses, so it naturally spreads within the population, same as in birds, uh, but never in cows. <clears throat> so we, we certainly didn't expect this one. Uh, okay, so you, you're keeping a close eye on this. Is it as easy uh, to you know to, for for uh, COVID nineteen? Wash your hands, wear a mask. Is this slightly different because it could be in food if this does get any worse? And I know that I'm 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 making it sound terrible. You you you're calming me down a little bit. But worst case scenario, it gets into the food, right? Well, at the moment, it seems to be replicating in, in the other, and so we're getting high numbers of virus in the milk, right. uh, and much more than we're getting in the, in the, in the fizzle the packages of cats, uh, which makes this one particularly weird, <clears throat> which means we have to um, now suspect that it's actually transmitted from cow to cow by the milking equipment. We're not quite sure. Mm. But the main thing is that the virus is killed by pasteurization. So the milk that you're buying in the shop is 100% safe. So there's no... The only danger would be... You know, we certainly would recommend that on farms where this occurs, people don't drink raw milk or unpasteurized milk. Um, in, um, and, and the same goes for the meat. If you cook the meat properly, then it kills the virus. Not a very strong virus. So right. It looks quite easy. Okay, so that raw milk that you see on the side of the road, don't buy it, rather be safe than sorry. Bottom line. Well, in, in, yes, certainly, I would say in general, but I mean, uh, the virus is so far, this is only occurred in the USA, yes. the only country in the world. So South Africa, I mean, we're 10,000 kilometers so <laughs> away from so yeah. quite safe stuff. Yeah, we were also very far away from China, Dr. Mark Times. And, and, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very fresh and very raw still. But okay, you, you've calmed me down a little bit. Dr. Mark Times, thank you very much. Manager of the Animal Health and Welfare Project and Veterinary Advisor at Milk South Africa. Yeah, when, I, when I see those, I do get a little tense. But Dr. Mark Chimes has made me. It's They're far away, and you can cook, and it's not a strong virus, and humans don't get it, the way I understand it. Uh, who's this from? Brian. Brian says, I don't get it. When the Americans, every time when they sneeze, they want us, the world, to catch also the flu. I end up not believing their truths as we winter. They want to run their businesses with their laboratories. Innovation viruses, says Brian Mabay, as written as typed. Uh, Brian, thank you very much from Protea Glenn. We'll take some more voice notes and some of your messages on Twitter as well. But now, though, four o'clock, time for the news with Eva Chipper. Top stories for this hour. Action SA vows to hold the new Ekuruleni mayor accountable. And Zuma calls the country's courts biased. Good afternoon. I'm Eva Chipa. Action SA in Ekuruleni says it will ensure that they continue to be an effective opposition and hold the new mayor of the city, Gosindi Pile Klagaz, accountable so that the residents receive the best services service delivery as possible. Earlier today, Klagaz was nominated and opposed during an extraordinary council meeting. Two weeks ago, the former mayor was removed through a motion of no confidence, leaving the city without an accounting officer. Action SA's caucus leader, Inegur Lendi, Sianda Mkub. Action SA notes the election of Councillor Klagaza of the ANC for being elected executive member uncontested and Action SA will retain its um, position in council of being an effective critical uh, opposition continuing to hold even this ANC-led administration accountable in making sure that services are delivered to residents and that Ekuleni is fixed in no time. MK leader Jacob Zuma has accused the country's courts of being biased. Zuma says this is because President Sol Ramaphosa was not in court today despite the private prosecution case against him in the Johannesburg High Court. The former president was speaking to party supporters outside the court following a postponement in his private prosecution bid against Ramaphosa. The president who comes after me doesn't come to court. It's surprising because money was found hidden in his pillows and mattress, yet he doesn't come and appear in court. What sort of democracy exists in a country where there are those who must go and appear in court for their cases and there are those who don't attend court? Where is that law? 
anga enkantolo lo mtheto upi in other news, more convicted murderers of Collins Chabani Mayor Moses Maleke have asked the High Court in Polokwane Limpopo to be lenient when sentencing them. Chane Omunyai and Funuzo Lizebe have also come forward to say they have families and children who depend on them. They were giving testimony in mitigating of sentences after being found guilty. All five of the men were found guilty of killing Maluleke at Chikundu village outside Malamurere in July 2022. One of the convicted Convicted murderer Zidzebe, however, maintains that he was implicated by the state witness Avatakari Murawuzi due to their personal differences. The first thing that I'm not in a good relationship with Avatakari, we've always been fighting for a long time, and I've never found myself being in his company. Every time when we fight, he always brings the community to my home street. Secondly, he has left my children suffering because he came and told lies before this court. Mpumalanga Premier Rifile Mtuen Ntsepane says they have to ensure the safety of community members who are living around nature reserves. This after some residents have raised concerns about animals that are escaping from nature reserves and damaging their crops. Some say this has also put their lives at risk. The Premier visited the Songyam Velo Nature Reserve where they are repairing a fence that was damaged by elephants. This is about a 90 kilometer stretch uh, around Songimvelo area. So we've already started putting up the fence, of which in this site will be covering about 80 kilometers of the of fencing around this area so that we protect. So we started with the critical site where these wild animals were coming this direction and heading towards the households and also the nearby agricultural areas. So we've just put up the fence so that we protect the produce of the farmers and also the wild animals. And lastly, looking further afield, Russia has called on all countries in the Middle East to show restraint and prevent the region from slipping into complete chaos. This after tensions were raised by Israel's suspected airstrike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus in the beginning of this month. The Kremlin says there have been no requests for Russia to mediate between Israel and Iran. It says the suspected Israeli strike on the Iranian consulate is a violation of all principles of international law. Israel has not confirmed it was behind... Sorry, Israel was, has not confirmed it was behind the airstrike in Damascus, but the Pentagon said it was. Recapping the top story for this hour, Action SA Nekuruleni says it will ensure that there continue to be an effective opposition and hold the new mayor of the city accountable so that residents receive the best service delivery as possible. I'll be back at the bottom of the hour for SFM News. I'm Yuba Chipa. In your sports, Chiefs retire Luke Fleur's number and junior box squad named for the under-20 rugby championship. More details at 4.30. SAFM. Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Yeah, 21 is giving us a bit of a headache again today. There's roadworks anyway between Pretoria and uh, the airport, plus a collision scene. So we've got queues on the R21 coming south into the first road to exit Clayville, and then a secondary queue, a heavier queue moving into the roadworks just by the Bobsfontein exit, and then that uh, queue extending down towards a crash scene just through the roadworks by the uh, uh, Bodoni exit. So extra pressure on your way down towards the airport. Uh, crash on Grayston Drive at the Mike 1, leaving Santon's heavy collision on the Mike 1 North at Crown. So coming in from the uh, uh, Boyson's area, that's all heavily backlogged. Uh, Durban today, a lot of pressure around Spaghetti Junction. There's a crash on the N2 going north uh, near Westwood Mall. So from Spaghetti up to Umgeta Road, it's very slow. And at the same time, a crash on the N3 outbound uh, to Spaghetti Junction. So that's quite a big queue back through uh, Sherwood and back towards the Felix Slamini area. And Cape Town, not a bad traffic pattern, as you might expect on a day like uh, today being Eid. Uh, there are some pressures on the N7 south at Goodwood. And the stationary, what appears to be a cash van on the R300 south after Fun Rip. Big road. Uh, there is a bit of queuing traffic pressure coming into that scene. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Stay safe on the roads. SAFM is with you. Here, there, and everywhere. SAFM 105.6 FM in Palabora. You are listening to John Herica on SFM. Remind me to tell to me about the Monte Carlo Masters. Please, we're watching Djokovic at the moment against Mosetti. 
Uh, so to remind me to tell her about the Monte Carlo Masters. Uh, coming up in this hour, we kick off the hour by bringing you the latest from the Western Cape Storm. Authorities are focusing on mop-up operations. Also, we'll go into a little bit more detail with uh, uh, an animal welfare shelter that is looking for fundraising and exactly what they are going through. Uh, many thousands of animals affected by that storm. Later on, uh, SAFTU, South African Federation of Trade Unions, calling a motorist to refrain from paying their outstanding e told debts. You might have seen in the news that uh, the, the big wig is saying that, no, 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 we might have shut down the e-tolls, but those debts that you haven't paid over all of those years, you're still going to have to pay for that. Soft is saying, no, nah, we don't. We will find out why they say that. Election Watch coming up towards the end of this hour. We feature a talk with Bongani Ngomane, PhD student. He's penned an article about the things political parties are promising and what we have to do to challenge them. And then you'll have an opportunity to challenge one of those political parties. Sarah will be joining us today. Uh, Colleen Makubele is the president of the South African Rainbow Alliance. From what I understand, it's a host of parties that have uh, very, very small parties that have come together to form another small party. They've admitted to taking uh, the GEAR program. They're going to defeat poverty and unemployment amongst young people and doctors. We will find out how they're going to do that in an hour. We have a long time to talk with them, and we're going to need your input on that, please. 86 2032 is the number. Say that again, 86 2032 Let's take some voice notes, though, in the last hour on 0614-104-107. A very good afternoon to you, John. Uh, John, judging from what is happening in Sudan in Khartoum, uh, judging what is happening in Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, and other African countries. You know, one thing that I've realized, how do people living with disability coping in those countries that I've just recently mentioned? It's so traumatic, it's so devastating, uh, John, seeing people living with disability going through so much. You know, I don't want to lie, I really want to applaud ANC for taking care of us. I'm the victim also. I'm in a blind sector. I would like to take this opportunity to call all people living with disability across the country to continue voting for ANC. ANC has been taking care of us. ANC has been rescuing us. You know, the peace that we have within the country is so marvelous. Thank you so much, John. Kazamola Koza Pretoria Social Move. I've, I've been meaning to talk about this for a while. Uh, trying to think how long ago. I did an interview just before Christmas, I think, maybe even last year, uh, about the, the new construction and new roads and buildings that have been happening in Melville because I drive through Melville every day to get here. And when I did the interview, I was very critical of the construction there because uh, it seemed as if disabled people wouldn't be able to do uh, and and work and, and get around in this new Melville construction. I'm going to apologize because they have done a fantastic job in Melville for people with disabilities. There are ramps uh, crossing in crossing the roads. There are ramps. Those special tiles for people with walking sticks are there. There are protection measures that have been put up so cars can't accidentally, you know, if you veer off the road by mistake, they've got those big pylons in the road. And every on the side of the road, there's parking, right? So you park in, you've got a parallel park to be able to park. Every single section, and there must be five or six of them, the last parking bay has been marked a disabled parking bay. This is in public parking. So it's not like in a shopping mall or something. This is on the side of the road, and they've marked in yellow disabled parking bay. So I want to congratulate whoever it was that was uh, doing things for disabled people in that new construction in Melville. Good afternoon, John. It's Brian Mabai from Protea Glen. On the matter between the former president with the IAC to register a party and be the leader of the party, John, kindly give us clarity between their cases with the Clinton Mackenzie one and the Kenny Kunene case having them to register the party with Kenny Kunene and Clinton Mackenzie having to register a party with the criminal offenses same as to Zuma one. What's the difference between them? Thank you. Uh, I've been told the big difference is if you less than five years your punishment you 
All right, oh, we're going to have to look into more of that. Lebo is telling me. Oh, within the last five years that you went to jail, then you can't stand. But if it was more than five years ago, then you can stand, I've been told. That's, which makes no sense to me. Although maybe, you, you see, I guess the theory is you've been rehabilitated, right? I don't know, but that's the answer. That, that Zuma's, Zuma's imprisonment, uh, and we can agree or disagree on, on why he went to jail, was less than five years ago, therefore he can't stand. But the others that you mentioned as well, that was more than five years ago, so they will be able to stand and go to Parliament. That's the answer I've been told. Conversations that you connect with and react to. SAFM. All right, let's go down to the Western Cape. Authorities focusing on mop, mop up operations. Houses have been damaged. You've seen roofs blown away, glass being broken, schools have been closed as well. The local government seeking more funds from national government to deal with some of the crises on the ground. Let's find out what's happening there at the moment with Colin Diner, Western Cape Disaster Management Centre. Colin, thank you. Uh, Colin Diner. Colin, thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon. Uh, how are the mop up operations going? Hi, John. Thank you, and good afternoon to your listeners. Yeah, so um, it's going well. Uh, you know, we fortunately only had the two days, and then Wednesday was uh, it stopped. It was still raining a little bit in the garden route, but we managed to start getting work done. Mm. So everybody is 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 working. Um, the big challenges at the moment, I think, in terms of humanitarian support, is uh, is in the garden route district. So we still have uh, around about 400 people in Otsu and that were affected. I got a call from Meisner this morning. They need some help with people also that were affected. Uh, we had to do a rescue day before yesterday, so that would be Tuesday, uh, in the mountain, you know, with people that, um, that it got stuck in, in Conquest Kluft, just between two rivers. So uh, a lot of work happening there. That was not, you know, as hectic as the winds we had in, in the western part of the province. And obviously there we're still working on a couple of schools. So the schools reopened yesterday, but there's still 10 schools uh, in the Cape in the Cape Winelands and in the metro, so six in the metro and four in the Winelands, that suffered damage. And the fire brigades went out yesterday and assisted quite a, in quite a couple of areas to help you know, with dangerous situations. And uh, so there's a lot of work going on, um, and we we obviously are hoping that by the weekend we should uh, be pretty much back to normal. A lot of trees blown over as well. Have they all been cleared out of roads and essential areas? Mostly, uh, there's, there's very few roads. Uh, in the Overberg, there's still uh, quite a couple of secondary roads, but in a lot of those roads are, are gravel roads, and, mm. and the rains there were pretty heavy. But in the city, in and around Chapman's Peak is still closed, but uh, generally uh, most of the other roads have been taken care of. Uh, the, the, I introduced by saying that the Western Cape are looking for uh, more money from the national government. Is, has there been any state of disaster being declared or something? Are there, are there special arrangements being made that you've heard of? Yeah, John, so the, 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 it's, a, it's a process. Um, and the way that it works is that, uh, f- first of all, the, you know, we are expected to, to look into our own budgets and our own funding, which we do, you know, after an incident like that. And then what we do is we do an assessment, and if we have a look at what all those damages were, we then request the National Disaster Management Centre to classify the disaster. So they will classify it either as a local disaster or a provincial disaster, right. and in a really bad case, a national one. And once we've received that classification, we can then declare a disaster. At the moment, we can't really say if that's going to happen. We still have to do the assessment. Uh, yeah, the- this explained, and for I mean, I, I I haven't been following the news as closely as I should have, Colin Dino, over the last few days. On a scale of one to normal, ten being normal, right? Oh no, let's do it the other way. One is a normal big Cape Town winter storm that hits, and ten yeah. is like the most extreme opposite of that. It's it's the worst yeah. thing ever. Where does this these those two days fall? Yeah, I've you know, in terms of the um, the 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 size of the incident, you know, the enormity of the incident, considering it was the entire province. Mm. Um, I would probably say around a six or seven. Wow. Um, but what I would also qualify is, you know, it, it, a lot of it depends on preparation. And uh, you could have, with very little preparation, a devastating incident. Um, so, and I think there was a lot of really good preparation done by everybody, you know, by our traffic services, our infrastructure people, education, mm. just the fact that they closed the schools. And I think so. The impact was not as severe as what I think it could have been with with the amount of of rain and wind we got. 
I'm thinking of people in informal settlements. Are they all, obviously mopping up there is, is a completely different situation to somebody in the southern suburbs. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, a lot of our focus has been there. So we have been working with National Human Settlements. They are responsible for what's known as the um, emergency housing grant. And I must say that uh, the kits that they normally provide to the people have arrived today and, and are continuously coming to arrive in the next few days. So that, that's going well. And obviously, you know, we focus with a lot of the work we have with, with the NGOs that we work with to, to put them in that direction, uh, you know, so that they assist with, uh, with food, food and not just food, but blankets and, and all the other necessities. So, yes, it is a different experience for them, and, and that's why we focus a lot on that. All right, well, Colin, keep up the good work. Colin Diner, thank you very much. Western Cape Disaster Management Centre there. SAFM values your views. Be an active citizen. Uh, let's take a quick break, I think. Let's, we've got to take an ad break, and then we're going to find out how that disaster has affected animals and the shelters that are looking after them as well. We're going to talk to Marcel Duplessis, fundraising and communications executive at the Nzananda Animal Clinic. Saturday nights on S3 are about to get dramatic. Tune into The Player at 9.30 p.m. and catch Wesley Snipes as a pit boss as he and his team gamble on the ability of security expert Philip Winchester to stop some of the biggest crimes imaginable from playing out. Can he take them down from the inside and get revenge for the death of his wife? Or is it true what they say? The house always wins. Channel your best drama with The Player, Saturdays at 9.30pm, only on S3. University of Johannesburg and University of the Western Cape have a mammoth task to illustrate what a pitch distinction looks like. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the Varsity Derby, UJ Ladies FC versus UWC Ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 3pm, live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. You are listening to John Gerica on SAFM. 20 past four, you with SAFM. John in for Ashraf this afternoon. It's the National Pulse. Uh, as you heard, affected humans, this Cape Storm. But uh, what about the animals as well? Clinics and shelters uh, pleading for funds so they can save these stranded animals. One of those in particular, Zananda Animal Clinic and Shelter, hit hard by those winds and torrential rains. Marcel Duplessis, fundraising and communications executive there. Marcel, thank you very much. How were you affected by the big storm? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yes, you know, our infrastructure was quite affected. Um, our outside fencing was blown to bits, and we also have quite a lot of roof damage, so we've got quite a lot of meat in our clinic and theater facility right now. And then we also had two really big heaters that were external heaters to heat up the animals that are in the cages um, while they are coming uh, from Marcel, I'm really struggling to hear you. Are you on a speakerphone, maybe, or, or can you get closer to your phone? I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right, there. That's much better. You were saying at the end you had what? Are you there? Yeah, go ahead. Can uh, let, you were saying right <laughs> Sorry at the about that. right at the end you were saying something about uh, two somethings. Yes, so we have two large external heaters that heat up the animals that are on cage rest after they've had, um, you know, treatments and things. And these heaters also blew over and they're quite expensive, so those also got broken. Uh, I know we're focusing on, on one in particular, Marcel, and this is your, your animal clinic and shelter, but uh, why, you know, why should we care about the animals and, and, and the shelters when you know, it's, it's, they're, they're just animals? What about the humans first? Of course, you know, and I think everyone is affected and we should look at animals and humans as sentient beings and just, you know, care for both of them. Um, and I think quite a lot of the shelters were affected. Mm. It's not as publicly mentioned, but we've heard of quite a few shelters who are also struggling, especially with ones who have outdoor kennel facilities. Uh, what? Okay, so obviously it, it takes a while. You guys rely on the public and for and, and sponsorship to be able to do your job. Yes, we completely rely on public donations and donations from grants and corporates. So we are always looking for assistance if there's ever a hand able mm. to help. What do you do? How do you help the animals? 
So we have pretty much anything that an animal needs in the Kylie Chan surrounding community areas. Um, we have a hospital, an operating theater, a mobile clinic, an ambulance, and then the shelter. And we also focus a lot on education to help people really become the best pet guardians they can be. All right, I didn't ask where you were. Kylie Chan is where you're based. That's correct. All right. Uh, and obviously, are you, are you still able to do some work or has it been so bad that you've had to shut things down? No, we are plowing through it. We have a little maintenance team that's been working really hard on doing all the fixing. Um, but you know, with an animal clinic, you can never stop. You just continue <laughs> as much as you can. Uh, it is, is it just dogs? What animals do you work with? We ninety percent dogs and then about ten percent cats, but every now and then we get a little tortoise or a little bird or something like that as well. Oh. Oh, do with with a storm like this, do you see an influx of of stranded animals? We usually do because you know what happens is that these animals are quite scared. So when there's thunder or lightning, many of them try and escape from the yard mm. and then they get lost. So we do get a, quite a few people calling us saying there's an animal walking, it's got no home, no one knows where it belongs, and then we have to admit it to the shelter and try to find its home. Well, I guess is what we were talking about earlier. If you, 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 you're trying to build your house together, then the dog might suffer a little bit and, and, and become a stray. Absolutely, that does happen. You know, people are struggling in the communities and sometimes they can't always look after an animal as well. Mm. Okay, uh, if somebody wants to help out, particularly Mzananda Animal Clinic, how do we get hold of you then? The best way is to pop us an email, which is info at Mzananda, and you spell that M-D-Z-A-N-A-N-D-A dot C-O dot Z-A. Or people are welcome to give me a call or a WhatsApp, which is on 082-357-7613. Uh, say that again, 082-357-7613. 7613. 7, I'll give that all out again. All right. So, and and obviously this is an ongoing, uh, ongoing, uh, ongoing shelter. You're there. It was seven days a week. I guess twenty four hours a day. If somebody needs you. Yes, we're we're open uh, six days a week, but obviously on the seventh day we still have people there looking after the sick animals. Mm. And we've been in Kailicha for twenty seven years now. Big storms, I'm sure. Are they? Are you going to make sure that things are, are more battered down le- next time? Because yeah, it's global warming is a thing. Things are just getting worse and worse. No, you're absolutely right. We actually really want to look at building a, a proper wall or something that's much more stable than just a fencing system that can get damaged, as we've seen now. All right. Marcel Duplessis, thank you very much. Fundraising and Communications Executive at Mzananda Animal Clinic and Shelter. Those contact details again. Info at mzananda.co.za. I'll spell that for you. Info at mdza. N-A-D-A, Mzananda Animal Clinic. So info at mzananda.co.za or you can text on 082-357-7613. I'll say it only once. 082-357-7613. Across South Africa, online and on radio. SAFM, let's talk. Let's take some voice notes at 25 minutes past four. We're hoping to talk to South African Federation of Training. In fact, we got the SAF2 guest on the line. Um, Trade Union Federation SAF2 are calling a motorist to not pay your outstanding e-toll debts. comes after yesterday's announcement by Transport Minister Sindesiwe Chikunga that e-tolls will be scrapped. The government's encouraged motorists with outstanding bills to settle them. Let's find out why Saftu disagrees. Saftu National Spokesperson is Trevor Shaku. Trevor, thank you very much for joining us. These are debts. Shouldn't people settle their debts? We don't think they should settle them. Just as successfully they have refused to do so in the past 13 years. The reason for this is because we are, by principle, against commodification of public goods and services, including public infrastructure. And in this instance, you have had the attempt to commodify the public road in Johannesburg and Gauteng, and uh, that would have created a, a, a burden on the working class that is already overburdened by a number of issues relating to the cost of living. So. We are encouraging them to just continue with what they've been doing, not to pay. Yeah, if we if we did that for everything, then nobody would pay their debts ever, and and the country would just going to rack and ruin. Surely, this is this is something that happened. People need to pay. Look, uh, there are certain services where, especially if there's not been a proper consultation and agreement, 
there ought not to be payment. And in this instance, refusing to pay is part of resistance, is part of a protest mm. from ourselves as the working class people to say uh, we are not consulted when these things were brought, and that is very important in ways of protest in rejection of this uh, uh, ethos. So this is not, of course, applying to everything, but we, as a matter of principle, say that we must refuse any user pay model, any uh, model that seeks to impose uh, cost recovery or other charges on the public services and goods like water, uh, infrastructure like, like roads. We think that the national treasury is quite capable of carrying these things on its fiscal. Uh, the trade unions will be the first people, Trevor Shaku, to say, uh, to, to moan that employees aren't being paid. This is now a debt that somebody has to take up, and the first people to suffer will be the employees. What do you have to say about that? We are saying that the National Treasury must carry the debt on its fiscal. Uh, it has the ability to do so, and uh, if it does so, there would not be problems there. And in fact, Sandal has not come out to say that it is failing to meet payment obligations mm. or of remuneration of, of, of any kind. So in, in that context, we're not dealing with a oh. crisis that is at hand. Well, they can, take, they, can take loans. they can take loans on the debts that are owed to them. And if nobody's paying those debts, then those loans default. No, no, no. If the Treasury takes and carries it on its fiscal, no one will be obliged to pay except that the the, the national government, using its uh, uh, money-creating powers, will be able to carry this at no cost. Money-creating power. Uh, what about people who have paid, uh, Trevor? What do you have to say to them that, that have gone through the routes and they've got their e-tags and they've been putting money into their account every month? Look, I think uh, we'll be able to make a pronouncement on, on those who have already paid uh, after a consultation with various working class and civil society organizations uh, and actually hearing those who have paid, what do they think they want out of this? Because mm. they want their money back. Uh, if, if, if you and I can get away with not paying, then why did they pay? That's the issue. Because when we made the call for uh, the motorists not to pay, they, they should have heeded the call and not... Uh, 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 fear that government would mm. pursue them in any way. Because United, we would have, just like we've done now, uh, uh, warned it. Because we must actually contextualize this victory. It is not the national government just coming and announcing. I think they are using it, of course, for electionary purposes. This actually it is the, a victory for the working class. It is a defeat on the part of government because they are the ones who are enforcing this particular e mm. and we have successfully refused to pay, and as a result, they are scraping them. And what do you have to say to somebody who's sitting in Uppington right now listening to this and go, why must I pay for those carting roads? Uh, uh, have we lost Trevor? We've lost Trevor. Sorry, Trevor's line just stopped working. I'd love to know what he has to say about that. And if you're in Uppington, I understand your worry. Uh, you, what, the, what, we, what we were sold, user user pays. So if you drive on the road, you pay for it. Same as if I drive from Durban to Johannesburg, then I pay on that toll road. What do you make of that? Give us a call, 86 0032 We'll see if Trevor can answer that later on. You with SAFM, half past four, time for news headlines with Eva Chipper. In your news making headlines for this hour, some opposition parties in Parliament say the institution has not done well in terms of its mandate to keep government accountable. This as the time of the sixth administration is coming to an end as the country prepares to go to the polls next month. In other news, the DA has won its case against the Electoral Commission to ensure more voting stations abroad for the May 29th general elections. And lastly, some opposition parties in Parliament do say that the institution has not done well in terms of its mandate. Leander Mahome will have more stories for you at the top of the hour. For SFM News, I'm Eva Chipam. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic.
Heavy delays to get on the R21 this afternoon. Two sets of roadworks and a collision scene. So you've got the roadworks approaching Clayville, causing backlog number one, and then a crash in the roadworks just past the uh, Bob's Fontaine exit. So that's heavier than normal uh, with the QX heading back towards the uh, engine uh, garage area. Uh, broken down vehicle uh, on the N12 East just past Galoolies. That's why you're stuck on the N3 coming south and the N3 coming north uh, into Galoolies interchange. That vehicle, I believe, is just being cleared, but it'll take a little while uh, for the traffic to normalise. Coming out of Durban, a crash at Spaghetti Junction on the N3. That's heavy uh, from sort of Tollgate Bridge territory is where you'll run into some trouble there. Uh, Umgeta Road at Springfield Park is busy going out and the M19 coming in through Reservoir Hills towards Springfield Park up towards the N2 is quite slow as well today. And Cape Town, there's um, a stationary vehicle R300 south just past Van Ribbick Road, slowing traffic from Brackenfell into Cales River and no traffic lights on the R44 at Annandale. They've been down all week, so heavy pressure leaving Stellenbosch en route to Somerset West. Rob Byrne, SAFM traffic. This is SAFM Sports with Dumin Kabele. Righty, in your sports this hour, let's start things off with football. Kaiser Chief Sporting Director Kaiser Mdaung has confirmed that the club will retire the number 26 jersey worn by uh, the late uh, Luke Fleurs. The 24-year-old memorial service was held at the FNB Stadium today where his life was celebrated by family, friends and the football community. And uh, he is set to be laid to rest on the 20th of April. And Mdaung says that the, the defender left a void in the club. Luke played with the class and aura of the yesteryear legends that wore this jersey. That's what he exhumed. That's what we all saw. And it's just, a, it's actually, it's a travesty, the fact that he didn't get to have his, his moments on the field. Since his arrival, it must be very clear, Luke was a consummate professional. He approached every training with the respect and honor that it deserved. We all have been footballers and when you're not getting game time, when you have to show up every day, working hard for your family, they ask you, but, oh, but you've been training well, so why aren't you in the team? He came with an amazing attitude. Every single day, did what he had to do to make sure that his teammates are prepared, supported, and loved so that they can go and give their best. Even though he was patiently waiting for his chance to show the Corsi nation what he can do. Meanwhile, Burnley manager Vincent Company has been handed a two-match touchline suspension following his red card against Chelsea on uh, the 30th of March. He will serve a one-game ban immediately with the other match suspended until the end of the year. Company was uh, protesting against a penalty decision that led to Lorenz Asinian being sent off. The Belgian later said that the standard of refereeing in the season's Premier League hasn't been good enough. The former Manchester City captain who uh, pleaded guilty to the charge has also been fined just over 235,000 rands. Then in rugby, head coach uh, Bafana Ntleko has included five members of last year's junior Springbok squad in uh, the 31-player tour group of the inaugural Under-20 Rugby Championship. The inaugural tournament, which uh, features the up-and-coming Under-20 players from South Africa, Argentina, New Zealand and Australia, will be staged in Queensland, Australia next month. And uh, today's squad announcement follows an intense period of preparations of uh, the SA Rugby Academy training group at the Stellenbosch Academy of Sports. The top team after the three-round um, six-match tournament will be declared the first champions. Then in athletics, South African five-kilometer champion Nicholas Siopo-Singwe is uh, hoping that his relocation to Kabeha and association will uh, breathe new life into his career. Having recently turned 23, Siopo-Singwe already moved from Zoo Lake training group to uh, Masail Athletics Club in Swane, and he now finds himself in the friendly city. Amidst a challenging phase in his career, the promising roadrunner is quite determined to reclaim his stride and soar to new heights under his new training environment. Um, well, I arrived here um, last year in November. Yeah, and that's when I decided to, you know, I uh, should just take a move from Pretoria, basically, because um, I was with uh, Violet, uh, in Pretoria for quite some time. Actually, not some time, but I think around like two months or so. So I've been with her. So we just decided now, nah, okay, Pretoria is in a good environment environment for me uh, in terms of, you know, when it comes to disciplinary and stuff. 
So just came to a conclusion whereby now I think maybe I should come down to PE you know, yeah, and nope. try out. Anything's off with cricket. Western Province men will know the importance of getting over the line when they visit the Oval and Potch of Stream tomorrow evening in the CSA T20 Challenge Round 11. Dropped to fourth position in the standings with 23 points after 10 games. A win tomorrow is vital for Saleh Nekadin's uh, charges, who will be looking to come back with the maximum points against the Auto Investment Dragons. Speaking at the training at the World Sporting Betting Newlands uh, yesterday, Nekadin admits that that the game to, that tomorrow's game is a very important one. On that note, is a wrap from my side for now. I'll have more in the next hour. Uh, What's Wait. up, John? Wait. I got something very important to tell you. Yeah. All right, Monte Carlo Masters on the go. Yes. All right, Novak Djokovic on court, and I'm sure you'll tell us about that next time, right? So now you know that Monte Carlo is not a very big place. Mm-hmm. From from one end to another end, 3.37 kilometers long. All right. Now even I can walk. That we were talking about that 5k run that we're doing. All right. Yeah. Did you know? Monte Carlo is a suburb of Monaco. Okay? Mm-hmm. So Monaco is the country. Monte Carlo is a suburb. Did you know that the Monte Carlo Country Club, which is where they're busy playing tennis, yeah. not only is it not in Monte Carlo, it's not even in Monaco. It's actually in France. It's outside of the border. How far away from the border, you ask? Well, technically, it's 500 meters away from... Let me just check the distance. From here to there. It's 500 meters away mm-hmm. from... Monte Carlo, which you remember, as I said, is a suburb, right? Mm-hmm. And I've got to get rid of that. Can I get rid of that? I can. And it is officially 300 meters outside of the country. Interesting. So the Monte Carlo Masters, not only in, not in Monte Carlo, which is a suburb of Monaco, it's not even in Monaco. It's actually in France. But I guess they can't call it the French Open, can they? Absolutely not. <sighs> yeah, Monte Carlo. You were there, say, FM. It's 29 minutes to five. Here, there. And everywhere. SAFM. 106.2 FM. In Zanin. Economic news on SAFM. Facts and figures you can count on. Quiet business news today. I think Makwe Masalela, but something's been happening in commodities. What's up today? Afternoon to you, John, and to the listeners. Yes, we know that this big inflation continues to be a big issue. But if you are trying to look into the commodities, we can see that almost all other major commodities are up with copper and palladium being the outlier. I mean, copper is down 0.6%, palladium is down 0.8%, but the uh, gold is doing okay. And the general market, the issue here has just been inflation. Big inflation forced markets to sledge based on how much the Fed will uh, reduce interest rates this year. That's if they manage to do that. And John, even if inflation were to ease next month to a more comfortable reading, there's a likely sufficient caution within the Fed now to mean that the July cut may also be a stretch. And by that time, the U.S. election might begin to intrude with the Fed decision-making. We know they've got the elections in November. And so the latest Fed minutes showing that some Fed officials are raising the possibility that the current interest rates were not tight enough, meaning they might be looking into increasing if a need arises. And we saw the Chinese consumer prices barely increasing from a year earlier last month, and industrial prices continued to fall, and that itself underscores the deflationary pressure that remain a key threat to the economy's recovery. But the U.S. wholesale prices, that is their fixed prices, increased less than expected in March, providing some potential relief from worries that inflation will hold higher for longer. And as expected, the European Central Bank, they left the interest rate unchanged, and that is for a fifth straight meeting, and said, if the current trends continue, that is, if inflation continues to ease, then it will be appropriate to cut interest rates. And the new jerk reaction was a weakening euro. And investors are growing increasingly anxious with the potential outcome of our national elections. We saw our February manufacturing production surging by 4.1%. 
beating market expectations of 3.5% rise. That's after going up by 2.9% in January. And our mining production grew by hope in 9.9%. And that is the most since July 2021. And that was also better than market forecast of 3.5% growth. And that's after going up by 2.8% in January. And unfortunately, after cutting 2,600 jobs at their PGM operations in South Africa, today Sibani announced plans to cut roughly 3,100 jobs if you include contractors or total plus minus 4,000. And that will be at their call to mining operations. And the brand could hover around $90 a barrel because of inflation. This high inflation dumping the rate cut hopes in the short term and traders are for a potential attack on Israel's interest by Iran. Brand crude but it's down not going 8% at $89.86. And the very same dumping the rate cut hopes were outweighed by safe haven demand. And that's because of those geopolitical and economic uncertainties and leading the yellow metal to maintain its shine. And as we said, if other commodities do okay, other than our copper and our palladium, gold is up 0.4% at 2,342, platinum up 0.2% at 1986, the Dow is down 0.7%, the S&P down 0.4%, tax down 8%, cap down 0.6%, Fuji down 0.8%, the GSC down 0.7%, and our financials are down 1.2%, industrials are down 0.8%, resources down 0.4%, the rent is flat against the most major currency, 1874 to the US dollar, 2351 to the pound in 2011. Makwe Masalela, thank you very much for that market update. We'll have more with the MoneyWeb market update with Jimmy Moyaha uh, Moyaha in an hour's time. Stay on top of all meaningful, top trending stories right here on SAFM. Leading the conversation. Take voice notes in a second. It's a quarter to five. Anonymous, important. Peter Marisberg, how's it? Hello, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? Good. No, Excellent. I'm good, man. Excellent. Just worried about this election, man. What are you worried about? This uh, Jacob Zuma, he can't take a beating, man. He, he can't, can't take a beating. What do you mean? Look, I mean, look at his age. And he wants to go back to parliament. Mm-hmm. Doesn't he know what he's done for this country? He sold it to the Guptas. They made his son a multi-billionaire. And now he's still going to... I suppose the only reason he's going back to parliament is going to get the money that he spent on all these attorneys to fight his case. That's the only reason I can figure out why he's going. He why says, don't he give He it says to he them? has unfinished business, that he still needs to do some things for the country. But don't you think he should give it to the younger generation to go back on uh, to parliament? Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's up to the voter to decide, right? You've made your decision. Uh, everybody makes their own decisions. And if people feel that he can still add value to the country, they have every right to vote for him. Okay, I understand, okay, you say that. But you know what he has done previously? I mean, look at the Guptas, what they've done to this country, where they are now. They're high, and they're flying high. Mm -hmm. His son became a multi-millionaire. He made his son, but he's not worried about the people that are suffering. The so, people that are suffering, so, they're not, dead with our yeah, food. I, I hear what you're saying, Anonymous, and, and, and you're, you're kind of electioneering to, for people to not vote for Zuma. But somebody else will phone up and say, well, look, he did great for the poor people, and the petrol price was lower, and the economy was better, blah, 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 and they list all the other things. Do, we, do you, as Anonymous in Peter Marisburg, trust the voters to make the correct decision? Hey, I hope so, man, because, I mean, they can see this country because uh, if you look at it, they inherited a, a country that was running. Look at Plaza, the airways, everything was perfect. And look at what's the condition of when, it now. When I'm was, sure when was like, everything perfect? Pardon? When was everything perfect? Well, almost perfect previously. When? When? We had the when? Raid, we had the transport. When? We had air. When in South Africa was everything perfect? Okay, it was almost. Let's when when was it almost, almost perfect, Anonymous? Yeah, previously. When? Give me a date. Give me a date. Give me a year when you say that South Africa was mostly perfect. Well, I'll say previously. Previous to this government. Previous to this government. So that was during Jacob Zuma's time as president. I suppose before that. Also. Before that. Tabo and Becky. Yeah. yeah, okay, Tabo and Becky. Tabo and Becky's time, South Africa now. was almost perfect. Pardon? So you're saying during Tabo and Becky's time, South Africa was almost perfect. Yes. Okay. Not compared to now. Compared okay. to now. Compared to now. Okay. 
All right, Anonymous, thank you very much. Anonymous, thinking, why does Jacob Zuma still want to stay in power? Let's go one more. Alfred is in Mpumalanga. Hello, Alfred. Oh, no, good. Lekker, go ahead quickly. I want to take some voice notes. No, fine. No, man, uh, I'm just being irritated by these people who are coming on the national uh, radio station blowing hot air against uh, Zuma. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zuma is contesting political power like anybody contesting, like anybody who has a right to do that. Yeah. And anybody who's being irritated by Jacob Zuma uh, must just find a space and cool himself or herself down. You see. But they also have a right. Same same as Duke Jacob Zuma has a right to stand. Those people have a right to be angry about it or, or be disappointed, whatever the case may be. No, the thing is, John. I'm irritated because those who are coming and complaining here or on the national TV, you find them being serving as a political zombies of the ANC. They therefore fight and, and, and defend the ANC I, I mean, at, the, at the expense of Uje uh-huh. I don't have a problem when someone uh, uh, doing all these things from the state but then I know that the more coming the nation and complain are those who have declared themselves as the political zombies of the ruling party. And it can't be. All right. It can't be. That is what I don't want, uh, John. All right. Alfred, All right. thank you very much. That, that line starting to break up so terribly. Sorry. Thank you very much for calling. Uh, political zombies, he was referring to. We've got lots of voice notes to get through. Let's see. Somebody's criticizing what I had to say. Let's play that one. Uh, hi, good afternoon. My name is Brandon. I think the people who stay in Kimberley cannot complain about paying for roads in Johannesburg because they don't complain when the uh, economic growth of Johannesburg funds uh, activities in Kimberley. So Kimberley cannot complain to pay for the, the roads in Johannesburg because Johannesburg, Johannesburg roads help pay for social programs in Kimberley. Thank you. Valid points. Let's go to this one about corporal punishment. Uh, good Good afternoon, John. It's Mono in Cape Town. John, guys, I, I think most of you in the mainstream media and these law experts, you are you are you are making uh, our country being um, a, a chaotic country for 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 learners. For instance, there are learners who are currently beating teachers because they don't know nothing about corporal punishment, and you. Uh, see, seemingly rubbishing those like me who grew up under corporal punishment, who believe that we are where we are today. We've got the respect that we have for elders because of corporal punishment. And you are rubbishing that. I heard from your statement. There is no elder who can just beat a child without any explanation. I'm sure that that um, uh, judgment came from the explanation of that teacher. So I think, guys, you must you must always look what is what you're talking about in the mystery media. Oh, I could have a debate with you for days. It's ten to five. You are listening to John Herica on SFM. Election watch feature as we build up to next month. Election feature. We talked to Bungani Ngamane, PhD student at Wits. He penned an article about the things political parties promise and what they're selling. Uh, In his article, one of the many promises the parties make don't align with the reality on the ground. Let's talk more about that. Bongani Ngumani, thank you very much. PhD student at WITS, specializing in applied drama and public performance ethnography with a master's degree in applied drama, theater and education communities and social context. Bongani, thank you very much. This this article, what I like the first bit, the first couple of paragraphs, you say that companies try to sell us stuff. Politicians try to sell us their ideas. What then? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and greetings to your listeners. Uh, when I was analyzing that, I was doing that specifically. I was looking, I was researching my master's research. And I realized that uh, my master's research was uh, titled The Invisible Faith in Democracy in Ekaslami, an exploration of public ethnography as a form of protest in an art based methodology. So, what I've realized that I've realized one of the participatory performance action of Abantu Vasekaslami in democracy through voting 
when uh, the period of voting comes, they wake up early in the morning, they are shipped at big houses or big houses to go and stand in long lines to cast a vote. So I believe that through this participation, a voice uh, to the voiceless is being adhered to. This is after a long persuasive campaigning to persuade, uh, to persuade uh, people in South Africans that change will be brought upon the circumstances of living. I mean, every five years, this campaign uh, does a similar thing, yet strategically different, with a more persuasive assurance and care to show people to, to the people. So, to me, these campaigns and their marketing qualities led me to uh, 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 to research also. And after finding out and discovering that South Africa was registered as a private corporation twice under the Queen of England. The question was also asked then whether uh, uh, it was just for the stock exchange that South African could trade with government bonds and found uh, relevant and insightful to compare the government registration and private cooperation with private companies, marketing strategies campaigns. Uh, because according uh, to this uh, uh, online thing, which is the Republic of South African uh, SEC registration 2029 uh, uh, with its registration number. Uh, the Republic of South Africa is seen as a company in the United States of America. Uh, so that has led me to write this article about uh, looking at the marketing strategies uh, similar to the uh, business strategy marketing to persuade our people in South Africa. Okay, so companies try to sell us stuff. If they sell us something that is off or isn't good or doesn't work, then we generally go somewhere else. Are you saying that same thing must we must do? We, we're the consumers or politicians. If they want to sell us something, their ideas, we must look at those ideas, and if they're unsuccessful, we must go somewhere else. Yes, basically what I'm saying there is that there are disadvantages to marketing that lead to a very substantial drawback. So the biggest implication of marketing strategies is that there is uh, a disregard and the aftermath and the implication of uh, possible fallout Mm -hmm. of promises not being uh, fulfilled. Although this article speaks uh, good uh, of goods that are sold to customers uh, who buy them, it can also be widely recognized as campaigning that takes place before the voting for a ruling party, for ruling parties, and, uh, and, and, and the reason why uh, we do that. Okay, so what do we as the consumer slash voter need to do? How do, we, how do we prepare ourselves for being a consumer of this marketing? So basically, uh, uh, it's not about falling for fleshy as an empty promises. Because I believe that democracy is about real change from those who want, uh, who, who want to vote. True democracy is about... Casting a, a ballot is up, it's not only about just casting a ballot, I meant to say, uh-huh. but it's about building a, 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 and holding leaders accountable and fighting for a better tomorrow. Because, I mean, let's cut, let's cut through the noise and focus on really what matters. Build a South Africa that uh, lives up to its promises a place where everybody has a fair share and nobody gets left behind. That is the kind of change I would like to see and it's worth voting for. Rather than every year, every after five years, we are promised uh, heaven and earth Mm. and we do not get anything. I even compared this situation with the book uh, Waiting for Borders, or if I bring (laughs) it into into a South African context, I compared it to Rosa Albert, whereby we're waiting for Morena, or we're waiting for the God that never comes, but we are still waiting with the hope that God will come. That's why I entitled my project The Invisible Faith in Democracy, because we, are, we, the people, we are voting with the invisible faith, hoping that someday change will come. But that change never comes. And then what do we do? 
Okay, so let me bring this analogy, Bongani, if you can, so that I can understand it in my head, where you're equating uh, a company that sells stuff to these politicians and their ideas. They, they, that's what they're selling us. So yeah. if I go to a shop and I buy, I don't know, I go to a shop, a shop tells me that this is the best vacuum cleaner in the world and it will clean your house uh, it'll clean your house in five minutes. I buy the vacuum cleaner and it doesn't clean my house in five minutes. What do I do? I go to the manufacturer and I complain and I make sure that they either fix the vacuum cleaner or I will go and buy another vacuum cleaner. You're saying the same thing. If a politician says they, they are going to make eight million jobs in two years and they don't, do I go to them and complain? I, I can't just wait. I can't just sort of put my vacuum cleaner in the shelf and go, oh, well, I'll wait until the next time. Uh, yes, on that case, I think that's why I said we need to hold them accountable. Right. And like our government right now, they have uh, promised us a lot of things and they keep on lying to the people. So if ever they're not keeping up to their promises, then let's vote them out. Let's find, let's find better, better alternatives that will work out for South Africa. Because even now, we have a huge gap of uh, rich and poor. Since 1994, that has been changed. And it's even got worse than what it was before. So okay. We need to really hold our, our people accountable. But we must the do that. Is, we must do that between the, the five years, though. Hand. We must do that between the five years, though, Bongani. We need to go to people and go. You've made promises. You're not fulfilling them, and, and uh, I want you to make changes. Otherwise, I will change. I will vote you out. Uh, I beg your pardon. So you still, it's not just those five years, every five years that we make the changes. Do, how is it our responsibility or is it our responsibility to hold those people accountable during those five years? Yes, definitely. We are the voters. We have the power. So we vote. Uh, this is our tax money. We pay for these things. Mm. Hence, there is uh, corruption now. So if we do not hold them co- uh, accountable, it becomes a problem to us then to say we are promised this in exchange of the vote. So we are trading the vote to say we, we send them to parliament to say this is what we need and this is how you need to do it. You need to do it. But if the people we send there and they're not doing that, then that's when it becomes the problem. All right. One of the things you said is you've got to vote them out. You've used those words. And I'm going to use my yes. vacuum cleaner analysis again you've looked at all the other vacuum cleaners and none of them none of them are something that you want there's always one little thing wrong the vacuum cleaner doesn't have a light whatever what do you do that's the that's the how hence we as the researchers we try to solve those problems because we've been trying to 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 see that hence now in my phd program i'm looking at uh uh, logic is greater or equals to logical. What I'm saying basically, I'm trying to find solutions by challenging the uh, conventional thinking of our leadership style and how we see things. And probably if we can change that method and see, try other methods, uh, method that will work for us, and then uh, I think it will work for us. Because now what I've realized, we are also working on uh, Western methods which are basically not working for our people. So those are the smaller things and kind of elements that we need to be aware of and try to change that for the better South Africa and use what we are strong in and what we know better to counterattack everything. Mungani Ngamane is a PhD student at WITS, and he penned that article saying uh, uh, that uh, we, it's up to us hold our political parties accountable. Then again, I wonder if we do, if I phone up the ANC right now and I moan about something, will they do anything about it? Or my local councillor, I phone my councillor and I do something, will they do something about it? I don't know. You're with SAFM. Luyanda has your news at 5 o'clock. Thank you, John. In your top story is a dim view of Parliament's ability to hold executive accountable and the DA celebrates court victory against the IEC. This is SAFM News. A very good afternoon.
Some opposition parties in parliament say the institution has not done well in terms of its mandate to keep the government accountable. This as the time of the sixth administration is coming to an end as the country prepares to go to the polls next month. Keeping the executive accountable is one of the key responsibilities of parliament as the legislative arm of the government. ACDP Chief Whip Steve Swart says the institution has been found wanting by the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into State Capture but never managed to improve its track record. The Zonda Commission clearly pointed out where Parliament failed dismally in holding the executive to account and preventing state capture and corruption. In this last five years, we've seen crisis upon crisis upon crisis. We've seen increase in load shedding. We've seen water crisis. We've seen ongoing state capture, corruption taking place. We see the construction mafia. We see so many issues and we do not see sufficient oversight from Parliament's perspective. In some election-related news now, the Democratic Alliance has won its case against the Electoral Commission to ensure more voting stations are brought for the May 29 general elections. This comes as the Electoral Court confirmed that the decision taken by the IEC not to allow voting overseas at consulates headed by honorary consuls should be set aside. The party said that their lawsuit originated from complaints by South Africans residing in Perth, Australia, who wanted the honorary consulate there to serve as a voting station. DA spokesperson Solima Lazi says this is a fig tree. We were very excited about the outcome of that case. This relates to the outcome of a submission that the DA had made on the 15th of February to the electoral court, including that the inclusion of embassies, high commissions and consuls as voting stations for the 2024 elections. Because what we wanted was that every South African who's overseas must be given the fair opportunity to cast their vote. Action SA in Eguruleni says it will ensure that they continue to be an effective opposition and hold the new mayor of the city, Nkosindi Pile Kagaza, accountable so that residents receive the best service delivery as possible. Earlier today, Kagaza was nominated unopposed during an extraordinary council meeting today. Two weeks ago, former mayor Sivuilio Ngotwana was removed through a motion of no confidence, leaving the city without an accounting officer. Action SA's caucus leader in Eguruleni is Sianda Makou. Action SA notes the election of Councillor Kagaza of the ANC for being elected executive member uncontested. And Action SA will retain its position in council of being an effective, critical opposition, continuing to hold even this ANC-led administration accountable in making sure that services are delivered to residents and that Ikulini is fixed in no time. The wife of this lane, Collins Chabani Mayor, wants the High Court in Bulukwane to give lengthy jail terms to the killers of her husband, Moses Maluleke. The widow, the widow Rangeleni Maluleke, was testifying in the aggravation of sentence. He, she has said that the late Maluleke says her late husband was financially supporting the family and the community. Maluleke was shot and killed at Shukundu village outside Malamulele in July 2022. She has said that she finds it hard to forgive the killers. These five men, they made him a light in his motor vehicle. They killed him at his homestead where he was felt that it's the place where he needed to be protected from. Every time when I'm at home, when I, I, I peep through the window, the vision of everything that happened to my husband, it always comes back to me. And finally, Lesotho's Minister of Natural Resources, Mutlomi Muleko, hopes the inaugural mining in Daba taking place at the Mantabisen Convention Center in Maseru will attract foreign investors. The event is aimed at reshaping the future of Lesotho's mining industry. It brings together key stakeholders in the sector to discuss critical issues and chart a path towards sustainable and equitable development. Muleko further elaborates. This is actually the country marketing itself in terms of its mining industry. And we hope to attract foreign direct investments for investors to come, see what we have, and do exploration in terms of some of the minerals that we have not exploited in the past, such as we know that we have potential of coal, we have potential of shale gas and oil. 
Recapping your top story, some opposition parties in parliament say the institution has not done well in terms of its mandate to keep the government accountable. They say the time of the sixth administration is coming to an end as the country heads to the polls next month. For SAFM News, I am Luanda Maume. Headlines at 5.30. In sports, Van Dijk looking forward to discovering new talent as TNL resumes Chiefs retire Luke Fleer's number and Mumbai Indians win toss and bowl against Royal Challengers. Bangalore. More details at 5.30. SAFM. Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Now, taking first up, it's still heavy on your way to the airport. Uh, roadworks on the R21 at Clayville. More roadworks with multiple lanes closed just after the Botswantain exit, so two queues to work through airport bound. And then if you're leaving the airport, there's some roadworks up by Pomona Road, so that's quite a heavy delay as you uh, line up sort of direction Tembisa and uh, Pretoria. N1 up through Midran, not looking too bad. No obstructions, at least just a bit of pressure of traffic. Uh, Durban having a busy one. An earlier crash on the N3 at Spaghetti Junction, still holding traffic leaving Durban from Felix Clamini into four level. A breakdown in the road to extend to south at uh, Spaghetti Junction. So uh, big queues coming through from Umgenero. And if you're inbound from New Germany, Pinetown, Claremont area using the M19, the truck has lost its load at the N2. And that's a really heavy delay. Durban bound coming in through the Reservoir Hills area. Earlier crash, N2 south of the Munsum Toti, still backing traffic from Arbor Crossing heading into the central Toti area. Uh, the side road, the R102, taking a lot of uh, diverting pressure. And Cape Town today, no traffic lights on the N7. Jake Scobell drive at Milton, so there's some extra delays moving through Goodwood. And a stationary vehicle still with us, R300 South at Van Ribbick Road. That queue is almost back towards the N1 Highway. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Stay safe on the roads. SAFM is with you. You are listening to John Gerica on SAFM. Uh, there's been some breaking news, and I'm sure Yolanda will, uh, Luyanda will cover it in 25 minutes or so. But O.J. Simpson, O.J. Simpson has died of cancer. He is uh, officially announced by the O.J. Simpson Twitter account. Uh, it says, on April the 10th, our father, Orenthal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asked that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace, the Simpson family. O. O.J. Simpson, dying of cancer at the age of 76. You'll be remembered for many, many things. Well, O.J. Simpson, that's breaking news at the moment. I'm sure there'll be updates with that throughout the evening as well. You with SAFM. Coming up in a moment, our election monitor. We're talking to SARA, South African, uh, South African Rainbow Alliance. We've got a little time with them, so we'll talk about that. But there have been plenty of voice notes and messages that have come through. I was going to read you uh, a good tweet that came through. Where was that tweet? It's, oh, it's a little while ago. Oh, yes. When we were talking about the European Union and accepting of refugees and immigrants, uh, Black Pride says those European countries are hypocrites. They collaborated with America to destabilize those countries, but now they're trying to prevent the consequences of their own dealings by blocking the same people whose countries they destroyed. Ya yeah, ne says that tweet. Uh, John, that's f- pie in the sky. The animal farm sheep will always just follow and follow and follow. They will not change, says Anton. And somebody wanted to know, I'm going to find out where this is. Somebody wanted to know, uh, is there a club to have, uh, is there a club you have to join for three to six show for voice notes or messages to be read? Aldrin's gone, but still no change. Maybe the show's for people with the highest IQ intelligentsia, says Anonymous. Anonymous, you didn't even send a voice note. Yet you send that. You've got to send a voice note for us to be able to play it. Let's take some voice notes. 0614-104-107. We're going to go to probably the beginning of the show. Good afternoon, John Herika and your hardworking team of producers behind you. My name is Mpepumpirin from Limpopo Mukumbani Village. John, there's something I do not know about the word of no confidence. Anyone who can help me, please teach me. If a mayor is removed out of vote of no confidence, maybe saving only three months, what happened to his salary and pension? He did not resign. He has been voted out. I'm asking this because municipality may lose so many millions because of this, and service delivery will not be delivered to the needy people on the ground. Please help me. I want to know. Thank you so much. I am Mpepumpere, Limpopo Mkumbani village. Nah. 
Good afternoon, John and your team. This is Sakilen Tsugin from Gamklabia Lingan. You know, John, I fail to understand how a person can ask for a short jail term, citing that they have family to support while they met at someone on whom his family depended as well. I'm talking about uh, those uh, murder accused who or killed uh, a mayor in Limpompo. Thank you. A very good day, uh, John. Mavia in Bloomfontein. Just thinking, um, just thinking, you know, is uh, an 82-year-old man really wanted, to, like, wants to decide a fate of a 21-year-old? I mean, Jacob Zuma is too old. He's been in and out of court for as long as I can remember. Does he really want to come and decide the fate of a 21-year-old? Please, Zuma must give us time. You really want to breathe now. We are tired. Thank you. Bye. Conversations that you connect with and react to. SAFM. Over the past few weeks, we've been speaking to various political parties about their election manifestos ahead of this year's national and provincial elections. Today, we tackle Sara's election manifesto. Parties promise to professionalize our political and public sector based on merit. It has its gear program. They're going to defeat poverty and unemployment rates amongst young people and doctors. Let's talk to the president of the South African Rainbow Alliance, Colleen Makubele. Colleen, thank you very much. Thank you, John, and uh, my greetings to the listeners at home. Let's get some background. Who is SARA? What? Because it, it's it's different to n- normal political parties, for lack of a better word. Well, not so different. Of course, it um, it was established as an alliance uh, consisting of various parties mm. that agreed to come together, you know, consolidate their voices, their votes, and consolidate their resources, and. Um, we didn't, uh, of course, count on me being fired. So <laughs> that fundamentally changed the uh, state us- of Sarah. So Sarah is a normal political party yeah. that any member can join, and we also do have ally- alliances. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, give us the story. You were fired. Yeah, I was fired um, by Lakota basically for. Um, Daring to want to be president. And um, uh, yeah, so that, that's the story that really, um, of course, shocked me, shocked the whole city of Jobek unexpectedly. So mm. having worked with uh, the president since July last year uh, in the formation of Sarah with various other parties that were participating and um, some that fell off for various reasons, policy reasons, some thought they'll go it alone, you know. And um, we were left remaining at that time in uh, November when I was fired. It was COPE, NFP, uh, there was a party called ICM, and uh, ARM, which could not, was registering as a party, but could later not. There were some, of course, we still have the church groups and some civic organizations. And when I was um, nominated by the collective there to be the president of Sarah, I think that didn't sit well. It's a typical problem that we have with, um, look, we can take it to gender, women, uh, confidence in women leading, and also uh, generationally so, um, that WhatsApp group of the the you know you can you can name them. Uh, all of them are on your posters now. Uh, they just don't want to leave the scene. You look at APC, UDM, and you ask yourself, what else do they have to offer mm. after so many years that uh, they've been trying this and getting one seat? Uh, some didn't get seats. They're coming back again. So clearly, the nation is crying out for something different, fresh leadership, new ideas. And the idea behind Sarah was to bring that kind of leadership, you know, and uh, that um, the majority of the demographics in this nation can resonate with. Uh, you spoke merit. Um, we speak women. We're speaking, you know, um, of course, not youth, but young enough uh, <laughs> to, to, to resonate with the issues, merit based and uh, also, we, we bring the godly values that we stand by and that we believe the nation really needs to go back to some command and control based on a common set of values that we have to stand by as a nation. Uh, we are too secular such that really we can't even control the basic social ills and that creates social disorder when there's nothing that um, binds the nation together, you know, um, yeah, it, right. it's lawlessness and, and, and disrespect and, and recklessness and, and just behavioral uh, conduct of ordinary citizen that is unexpected in a country that um, has some degree of first world uh, qualities to it, you know. Um, look at how we behave in the streets, how we pee and we and, 
you know, children shooting teachers at schools, you know, traditional leaders are complaining of disrespect of young people that think democracy is disrespect. So those also, those social disorders, they talk to values that have been lost yeah. uh, along the way. Okay, so much to unpack. Let's, let's talk about the elephant in the room, though. You and Patricia Dill, probably from what's quickly just thinking about it, the two female leaders of political parties in the country. Is South Africa ready for a female president? South Africa is ready for a female president. When we go and talk to the citizens, we we, we, we get that um, uh, message loud and clear, and they resonate with Sarah. And uh, perhaps to a large degree, I can speak to why um, uh, Auntie P has stayed on until now. And people are tired of... Um, men that we have continually been voting for, who have really not cared enough for communities. There's a sense that a woman um, may have some sort of a, um, a conscious, you know, um, not so, and moral values that bind a woman to know, I look after kids, I must be able to work and, and take something home and leave something for the children. We're generational thinkers and we're we are builders rather than men who can pack up and go and leave you. And we've seen, um, especially in our black communities where women have single-handedly raised children and raised communities. So women are crying out for that. But you know where, the, John, the problem I think is, and, and I'm so grateful that you invited me for this interview. But I think the media and the funders, who are very important to any political party's success, are not ready for a woman leadership. And I'll tell you this. I've been in a office uh, as a speaker of the city of Johannesburg. Um, yeah, you may criticize, but I think I've done a pretty good job. You know, uh, they may not have liked some of them, what I stood for at the time. Of course, I was under the umbrella of COPE and um, having moved uh, uh, um, coalitions, you know, some people didn't take that well who belong to the multi-party. But give or take, I, I, I did a good job. The communities resonated. For the first time, people understood what a speaker of the city does. And I was visible. And when they is no mayor like now, you know, at the time, you know, I was um, really strongly filling in the gap. And I come with those credentials, educational background, qualities, experience, and, you know, you can package it. I've been tested a little bit in the, in the public office. And you get people that walk out of some corporate office, they're going into politics for the first time, never set foot on a campaign ground. You don't know if these people really have that which it takes to be a politician, the heart, the servanthood, the charisma that it needs, and all other qualities that goes with being a politician, not just technical crunching of numbers and, you know. And they walk in with 15 million rands, they walk in with 100 million, some did not even make it to the ballot box, uh, to the ballot paper, but, you know, already the confidence placed on them was tremendous and overwhelming and shocking, to say the least. And here we are still struggling to say, funders, look at what we are doing. We had a big manifesto filled in a stadium. Some of those who were funded 15 million and others, they could only fill a hall with 2,000 people. You know, and uh, you can see that really, is it because I'm a woman that there's no confidence? If I have to get 100,000, I must explain 20 things to them. You know, so it, it's a problem. Even media. I say this because without this platform that we, 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 we really um, um, honor, respect, and, and, and also hate at the same time because you <laughs> bash us, but we need it to get our message out there, right. especially for new parties like us mm. that do not have the time and, and the luxury of the resources to reach the, the breadth of this country like others started 40 years ago, 100 years ago, some, some 10 years ago. So we, we need media to carry our message, but the, the, the reporting is not balanced. Um, our manifesto was not covered. Others, they ran the whole day. You know, it was only SABC who came and did an interview. It was mm -hmm. not even live. All manifestos that you see are live. The big you, stadium event uh, things. Big stadium event yeah. things. that it, Not even big stadium. The, the small hall, the, the school hall events things. that They are live too, John. You know, we don't rest. E-news, newsroom, everybody's there. And, um, and I've been complaining to say, really? Mm. Uh, what was different with our manifesto with any other manifesto launch that was there? And um, we took it actually to where the people are. We didn't do it here in Gauteng. You know, we took it to where the 
people are, where their needs are. We spoke to uh, all those people who are the statistics that we quote of, of, of unemployment, mm. poverty, uh, whatever you, you would have seen, even where we were. We didn't even have power. We had to get generators to put it. Because it was a statement we wanted to make and a statement we did make, you know. Colleen, I need to interrupt you. We're going to take an ad break. We've got so much to delve into. We've got a long time together. If you want to talk to Colleen Makubele, president of the South African Rainbow Alliance, now is your opportunity, 86 2032 You can send us a voice note as well on 614 University of Johannesburg and University of the Western Cape have a mammoth task to illustrate what a pitch distinction looks like. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the Varsity Derby, UJ Ladies FC versus UWC Ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. South Africa is facing an increase in people diagnosed with non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancers, hypertension, lung problems and obesity. This also increases the number of people living with these diseases and mental health. Many people living with these preventable diseases may not be immediately aware unless they go for health screening and testing. It is our responsibility to invest in our healthier future through regular physical activity, healthy diets and avoiding risky health behaviours such as alcohol and tobacco use. The Department of Health urges people to go for regular health screening for early detection and effective treatment if they are diagnosed with any of these conditions. This message is brought to you by the National Department of Health. In the heart of South Africa's coal-rich province in Pumalanga, the Council for Geoscience pioneers the fight against climate change with the implementation of the Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage Project, the CCUS. The CCUS technology captures carbon emissions at their source, securely stores them underground at carefully selected geological formations. This endeavor not only mitigates CO2 emissions, but also supports vital coal-dependent industries for South Africa's development. Near Leandra, the CGS has identified a site that will pilot this project as one of the development imperatives towards achieving a low-carbon economy. Across South Africa, online and on radio. SAFM, let's talk. Colleen Makubele is the president of the South African Rainbow Alliance. So much to talk about. Um, I want to talk about the alliance, first of all. The, uh, it's it, We're seeing these coalition things popping up. You've almost taken a step further already you've, you've got these small very small parties together was that a difficult challenge to find a common ground or are you open to all these different voices maybe pulling in different directions no it's a, it's still a great challenge to be honest with you and we have lost some and some are, are coming in um Number one uh, it was a challenge of policy alignment mm. because we don't um you know, there are parties that believe in land issues, Africanism, etc., and which we just think are ideologies that are not practical. Parties that believe in socialism and, and, and going into the far left, which we don't stand for. Um, we made it clear that we are a pro-business party. We are, uh, That's why we adopted the, the gear. We call it the Sara gear because of our business-friendly approach and um, job first. That's mm-hmm. what we think is important for South Africans, food on your table, money in your pocket, so that you are able to afford your basic needs, etc. So some uh, felt they didn't want, uh, they didn't resonate with that. They wanted to focus on land issues. But what do you do with land when you don't have a job, when you don't have income? You can't uh, cultivate it, you can't build on it. It's, it's just... Um, it's a nice, it's, it's a nice concept, but impractical. And you need um, uh, two thirds majority to change the constitution to to grab that land. So those fell off. Um, even in terms of the the values that we perhaps resonate with, and uh, we stand for godly principles, and we are clear on that. And um, um, most of us are, are Christians, and we, we stand on those biblical values. And some did not resonate with that, and so they left. And um, But now, one of the key things that have caused some to leave now is that people come hand in cap, 
in an alliance, thinking that um, as the leader of the alliance, you must fund uh, everything that they do. Um, you know, they are not bringing in the numbers that they said they have. Mm. You, you want now the database, because especially when we needed to do the signatures for IEC, then you realize these people are bluffing. They have no people behind them. And we have to now go to the ground, but then you must carry their expenses and their expecting seats. And so it becomes a, a, a tug of war on, on, on some expectations of um, a, a power without putting any skin on the table. Because being part of an alliance, you're, mm. you're not just jumping on a gravy train. It's work, you know. So some fell off because of that as well. Um, we are we are left now with us. As, Sarah, as I said, it's a political party which is standing on its own, etc. We still have uh, the traditional leaders. We've got ICM, the Independent uh, Citizens Movement, as a party that is part of us. We've got uh, AMSA, which is a party out of uh, KZN, which is part of us. And um, we are talking to this one party that wants to join us out of um, Pumalanga now. Some fell off for those reasons of mm. jumping onto the gravy train and expecting that uh, Colleen and everybody else is going to take you to parliament. doesn't work that way in an alliance. Uh, okay, where will you be standing for election? I'm standing as a presidential candidate for, for Sarah, okay. and I'm also standing as a Gauteng Premier candidate for Sarah. In Gauteng, okay. In Gauteng, you yeah. personally. And, and the, the party standing everywhere, or is it just certain no, provinces? No, we, 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 are in, we are national. We are standing in for national elections, so mm-hmm. you'll see us on the national ballot uh, paper. And we're also contesting two provinces, which is uh, Gauteng and Limpopo. Okay, any particular reason? Look, um, first is because whew, the amount of work to gather the <laughs> signatures. Um, we are only four months old. Right. We could not uh, gather as much as we wanted. But we had gathered over 110,000 signatures. If I tell you, John, that um, 60% of them were invalid. Wrong, uh-huh. wrong IDs that were given. Some of the people that gave us IDs didn't register to vote. So those automatically fall off. Mm. We could have qualified for more provinces and we're very close for other provinces. But we just felt, look, the, the, the timing and everything else. And as a party that is building up, because we don't see 2024 as the be all and end all, as some, you know, are coming and gunning for 2024. Yeah. We know that we are here for the long haul. And this is just the start. And we are going to build 2026 and to uh, 2029 as well. At l- just looking, and we'll go deeper into your policies. Um, mm. uh, strategy one, less government intervention, four pillars of the gear, which you said, uh, economic growth to create employment, SMME friendly, you mentioned that as well. Mm. Would you? Is it fair to say that you are right, and you bring in uh, the godly aspect of it, mm. is it fair to say that you are right-leaning in South African politics? You're, you're tending towards being more conservative. I think we, we, we are more liberal. We are middle ground. We've taken the middle ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's slightly right-leaning, but we are middle ground. Because as much as we believe in business-friendly um, policies, we want to um, revise and do away with a lot of what is in our labor laws, which is uh, hindering SMMEs and business from growing, creating employment and reinvesting. Uh, some of the BE laws that we want to look at, etc. We do believe in resto- redistribution which is grants that we do have the most vulnerable people that we know deserve to be on grants but Mm. we just don't believe in uh, creating a nation that is reliant on grant like what we have now you know almost I think over 20 million people in this nation monthly depend on grants 7 million of those are the 350 so we are are not creating self-reliant citizens you know they are relying on government as an employer as someone government must give them bread to eat government must give them a house and all of those kind of things so uh, um, and we do believe in, in, in providing homes, you know, for the vulnerable as well. But uh, we want to put as many citizens as we can back at work to be productive mm. and um, to be able to create opportunities even for others in terms of if they're in business, creating more employment, etc. So that's what we stand for. So create, just so I understand it before we get to news headlines, create more job opportunities and but in doing so, you don't need to give as many grants to people. And you Certainly. don't need to supply all those other things that we have reached the point of at the moment. 
And we can't afford it with the high debt levels that we have as a country. Mm. I mean, we can't borrow to give grants. Okay. If we're going to borrow, we must be investing to be productive, profitable, and to pay it back, because now we can't even pay it back. So we, 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 we are saying that our policies that we've put in place, which is denationalization uh, under our growth policies uh, for economic denationalization, 24-hour economy, cutting down taxes, uh, exempting SMMEs, will ensure that we create jobs. Okay. And therefore, you don't need to be paying so many grants, but only the most vulnerable people with disability, the elderly, and you know those really that um, cannot find their job. And mm. then you are able to be, give meaningful grants not 350 3000 so the cost of living is too high you know let people be able to live out of the grants but you give them this 350 that they can't even reach home because they have to take five taxes with anything meaningful it, it's just defeats the whole purpose all right we're going to find out how you're going to do that colleen makubele is my guest for the next half hour president of the south african rainbow alliance we've got colin in rustenburg we'll take your calls and we'll also take some voice notes as well uh, it's 29 minutes to six luanda has your latest news headlines Thank you, John. In your headlines, Banya Steelwater has announced that the planned restructuring of its South African gold operations could result in the loss of over 4,000 jobs. The company stated that the restructuring was intended to stop the losses at its Beatrix One shaft, which has been unable to provide expected production. Some opposition parties in Parliament say the institution has not done well in terms of its mandate to keep the government accountable. This as the time of the sixth administration draws to an end as the country heads to the the polls next month. And former American football running back O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76. Reports indicate that he passed away after he battled with cancer. I'll have details on these and other stories at 6. SAFM Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Just the one set of uh, roadwork delays on the R21 now. It's the um, lane restrictions before Olifant's Fontaine that are slowing things up. Once you get past that, the work zone between Bob's Fontaine and Benoni is actually moving okay. Uh, there are some roadworks going northbound as well up around uh, Pomona Road, uh, so that is quite slow leaving the airport area. Uh, the rest of Joburg side, well, there's some pressure getting off the N1 south of 14th Avenue. Some traffic light issues there has come off the highway, so a delay uh, from as far back as Bay as Nordea. Uh, Durban, there are breakdowns now both sides of the N2 between Umgena Road and Spaghetti Junction. One goes going north, one going south, so it's a real car park out that side today. Uh, also the M19 trying to avoid it, coming in from um, New Germany and Claremont side. Uh, truck has lost its load at the N2, and that's a really big delay, passing sort of Westville and in through Reservoir Hills towards that scene. Option would be the M13 or the N3 to come out of the Pine Town side on your way into Durban. Today, Cape Town, a stationary vehicle still with us, R300 south at Van Ribbick. That's a really big backlog to the N1 highway. And a crash at Kyalicha is between Baden-Powell and Spine Road delays both directions and a grass fire, a big one down at Ottery causing delays and backlogs both directions on the M5. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. This is SAFM Sports with Duming Kabeli. This uh, hour, let's start things off with netball. Proteus uh, head coach Jenny Van Dijk says that she's looking forward to the prospect of discovering new talent in the 2024 Telcom Netball League. Netball South Africa today launched the new TNL season in Santon with 16 teams already to contest for the title from the 26th of April. And Van Dijk says that uh, many players who performed in the league last season have now signed with professional leagues abroad, with the new TNL talent therefore crucial in trying to close the gap. You know, a lot of the players that played in the league last year have now moved over to the UK League, some have moved over to the Aussie League and also to the New Zealand League. So, obviously, some players will be taking that position and it will be new players. And I'm looking forward to seeing, number one, can the S under 21 baby Pratias that played now back themselves in more senior performances as we move into the TNL. So I'm looking forward to seeing them play. But I'm also looking forward to seeing who else is going to put up their hand and say, OK, listen, yeah, have a look at me. And, and just to get to know all the new players, you know, over the past three, four years, I've been a selector on every single level. I, I knew every single player by name and by everything they can do. And I'm, I'm, I hope to see a few new um, faces as some of the older players um, stop playing, like Bongi as well, you know. 
Moving on to golf, the Masters is officially underway after delays due to bad weather at the Augusta National. The 88th edition of the Masters will see Spaniard John Rahm defend his green jacket, while world number one Scotty Scheffler is a strong candidate to win his second. And uh, Rory McIlroy is still searching for his first Masters victory. And uh, five-time winner Tiger Woods has said that he's capable of winning despite recent injury struggles. In football, Amatak's coach Lisang Mutaung says that he's bracing himself to take on Mamelodi. Sundowns uh, that's almost uh, impossible to beat. The University of Pretoria hosts Downs tomorrow night in the quarterfinals of the Nepen Cup, hoping to be the first side to defeat the Brazilians since December last year. Although his uh, counterpart, Rulani Mugwena, claimed Sundowns aren't at their best, Tlisani argues that they don't need to be to uh, they don't need to be uh, the win matches or to win matches. I listened to in fact I was watching the match. Uh, I heard him saying that uh, but one thing about sundowns, it, no matter how they play, they're able to get results somehow, you know. So one has to obviously be in cognizance of that. Uh, they don't have to be at their best to win matches. Maybe the issue could be we want to score a lot of goals. You- then uh, the Premier League will use semi-automated offside technology before the end of the year. Its uh, implementation is expected to cut the average length of VAR check for offside by 30 seconds. Semi-automated offside is already used in uh, the Champions League and Serie A, while not exactly the same system, is also used at uh, the World Cup in Qatar 2022 with a chip embedded inside the match day ball. Just to, expl- uh, to explain it, the system will use camera footage and tracking software to calculate the position of players at the moment of a potential offside so an assistant referee will not wait for um, an attack to be finished to raise his flag, um, he'll be able to raise that flag immediately. Then in rugby, the Bulls and Sharks will try to advance to the Champions Cup and the EPCR Challenge Cup semi-finals re- uh, respectively for the first time this weekend. The Sharks will uh, take to the field against Edinburgh at uh, the Kings Park in uh, the Challenge Cup quarterfinals on Saturday, while the Bulls take on Northampton Saints in England following their comprehensive win against Lyon. The Bulls will face a formidable force in the Saints, who are unbeaten in the competition this season and currently top the premiership table with 10 victories in their 14 matches. And then finally in tennis, Novak Djokovic beat Lorenzo Musetti 7-5 and 6-3 to advance to the quarterfinals of the Monte Carlo. He uh, next faces Alex de Menor tomorrow. But that's it. It's a wrap from my side for SAFM Sport. SAFM 104 to 107 Nationwide. Getting more money into your pockets has never been this simple and exciting. With SABC's new Simple Watch and Win Game Show, you can get more Zaga in your pockets. Catch more Zaga every weekday on SABC One at 9 p.m. You could win your share of 50,000 Rand. All you have to do to win is give the correct answer for the day. Just dial star 120 star double three to hatch to register and play. The cost is 1 Rand 50 per minute. You could win big with more Zaga only on SABC One. University of Johannesburg and University of the Western Cape have a mammoth task to illustrate what a pitch distinction looks like. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the Varsity Derby, UJ Ladies FC versus UWC Ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. Economic news on SAFM. Facts and figures you can count on. Jimmy Muyaha, good evening. What's happening in the Moneywood Market Update today? Good evening, John. Nice to speak to you again. Yeah. Good evening to Dumi and good evening to the listeners. Uh, we've got quite the interesting show today. Uh, I'm chatting to the We Buy Cars CEO around that listing that happened today. Uh, first trading day going through. Uh, we're going to touch base with the CEO and just get a sense of uh, the roller coaster that was the day. Uh, and then we've got a conversation around uh, an interesting um, reality TV show, uh, Listing Cape Town. It premiered on BBC Lifestyle a couple of years ago. Uh, they've got season two. 
2 going on now. We're going to be looking at that and just looking at the Cape Town property market in general. That seems to be uh, quite the demand-based market at the moment, and we've got a lot of uh, interested clients, and apparently there might not be enough stock in terms of properties available in Cape Town. And then I've got a conversation for our SME of the week uh, this week with uh, a homemade olive oil company. They make extra virgin olive oil, and they are retailing at Woolies at the moment. So I'm going to speak to the founder um, of the company and just get a sense of everything that's gone into building that company because I can imagine it would have taken uh, quite a bit to get through. And then I'd been digging down or diving down an interesting rabbit hole for the last couple of days around the preservation order that was obtained by the uh, South African Reserve Bank as it related to the assets of a one Miss Burdine Urendal, who was uh, supposedly the former uh, ex-girlfriend to the late Marcus Eurster. Um, the preservation order is particularly interesting because some of the conditions and some of the um, benefits that were in that order don't seem to make sense. So we've been trying to unpack that with uh, a legal expert and try and understand uh, what that means and what's going on there and where all the money is at the moment. Um, and we'll dig into that just after six and see where, what we find out and what we know up to now. But before we get to all of those things, uh, the markets have had quite an interesting day following that uh, listing of uh, We Buy Cars. Uh, it looks as though that was one of the only good things about the market today. And keeping an eye on the markets was Henku Kreer. Uh, and he joins me now to just reflect on some of the market movements. Good afternoon, Henku. Thanks as always for keeping an eye on the markets. Bitcoin back below 70,000. The Rand back above 18 rand 50 it seems as though it was too good to last yeah i agree with you jimmy hello to you and to john and to Tumi, and good evening to all the listeners yes and uh, also quite a red day uh, well mixed markets um in the u.s at this stage with the dow jones losing 0.5 percent the s&p 500 trading 0.1 percent weaker but the nasdaq um looks quite good and in the green about 0.5 percent up but then European stocks, they finished them in the red and quite deep into the red, like the DAX, which lost 1% today. Then the CIC 40 and the FTSE 100 each lost 0.5%. The JSE finished 0.3% weaker at a level of 75,303 points. The Industrial and Resources Index, those two, lost 0.4% today. And the Financial Index finished 0.3% weaker. Glencore had a couple of wonderful days, but not today. Glencore lost 2%. And then Anglo and BHP, each 1.6% weaker, and Richmond and Process. Those two each finished the day 1% down. Other companies um, on the negative side of things for the day, Sabanya Stillwater, which lost 3.1%. DRD Gold, 3% down. Netcare, Omnia, as well as Pick and Pay. Unfortunately, Pick and Pay again. Those three companies lost 2.5% today, and Exaro finished 2% weaker. On the upside, Northern had a great day, 4.5% stronger. Afrimat also gained 4.5%, Implats 3.5% up, and Tungela, Amplats, Arm, and Goldfields. These mining companies, they each uh, finished 2% up at the end of the day. On the commodities market, the price of gold is $2,345 an ounce. Silver trading at $28.13, platinum $978, and palladium now sitting at $1,050 an ounce. The price of Brent crude is $90 a barrel, and if we have a look at the exchange rate, you will pay 18 Rand 77 for a US dollar, 23 Rand 50 for a pound, 20 Rand 10 cents for a euro, and 12 Rand 24 for an Australian dollar. Bitcoin still maintaining its level of $70,110, and that's a million three hundred and forty-five thousand rand. Jimmy, that's how the markets perform today. Very interesting day on the markets indeed. Lots to dig into, lots to unpack. I'm also going to reflect on that Sibanya announcement of that Section 189 uh, that they are currently looking to explore and what that means for the jobs that are at risk there. But we'll dig into these and other stories when we come back a little later. For now, John, back to you and the team. Jimmy Miyaha, thank you very much. Many web market updates in 18 minutes or so. 
Call us on 086-000-2032. My guest is Colleen Makubele, president of the South African Rainbow Alliance. In our election, We're looking at election manifestos of political parties today. We've had an hour. We'll take some voice notes in a minute, Colleen. I've asked many questions. I could ask questions forever, but that's not the point of the show. Mm-hmm. Let's see what people think. Colin is in Rustenburg. Hello, Colin. Hello, John. How are you? Lekker, go ahead. Question for Colleen. Yeah, look, I don't know how many minutes I have, but I'm going to try to summarize my, 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 my statement. Quickly, and, uh, quickly. And, yeah, yeah, and still be coherent. You see, um, one of the things that, that are going to be taking us back in South Africa is this thing that women Makubele and, and others are doing. This thing where, this tendency where every man and this dog feel like they can, they, they want to start a party on the street because they want to, they want that one seat and continue feeding themselves and their family and having proximity to power. And, and this thing, you see, how do you see this thing? You see it in, 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 in also in this behavior that they, they, they don't respect the mandate of the people. Colleen in, in COPE there in Jobeg, she had, they had two seats or three seats in, in the council, but then she wants to become the, 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 the speaker of, 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 of council. She wants to become the mayor of the council. Because we as the people give the politicians the mandate that no, as, as a group of people, we have selected, we have given this party a uh, 35%, we have given this party 35%, but then Colleen with a one seat in parliament, she would want to be president. Yeah, when, and then you ask Corey, okay. what are you going to do? You ask, let, let me finish, let me finish. Quick, you, quickly, you we, we kind of got the gist of what you mean, but quickly, quickly. It is. You ask her, what are you going to do? What do you think, what do you think needs to be done in South Africa to help South Africa? She gives you generic answers. A layman on the street can tell you those answers. What we want to know is if you were, if you had the power, if we gave you the majority tomorrow, what exactly are you going to do? Don't tell us you are going to create jobs. Even even a child of five years can tell you people are jobless we, in South we, Africa and therefore need to create jobs. All right. So, we're getting to that, Colin. We're getting into the nitty gritty. Colin in Rustenburg, thank you very much. Yes. Two points. Uh, thank you very much. Colleen uh, Makubele. Yes. Uh, first point that you're a small little party uh, and, uh, why, and you're just joining to get onto the gravy train. I think it's ignorance talking, and I'm, I pity Colin because um, his lack of understanding of a political landscape is coming through. You know, um, no one gave anybody a mandate in the city of Joburg, as an example, because nobody won the elections. So all the parties that were there, you can probably say they lost elections, whether you lost by one seat or by 20 seats or by 40 seats. No one was given the mandate to govern. And therefore, it necessitates for coalition government, which happens anywhere in the world. And we've got a constitution that allows us to say you can be an independent candidate that comes with one seat and be able to be in government and add value. And uh, the notion that... um, you know, you need to have 50, 60 seats to be able to add value to the policy direction, to um, uh, socioeconomic issues that people are facing. I think it's totally and completely wrong and misinformed and misleading to the to the listeners. And second to that is that um, I did not elect myself to be speaker. When people see value and experience and uh, trust and have confidence in what you bring to the table, they elect you to lead. Same as when COPE saw uh, what I could offer, they then uh, gave me the opportunity to be um, a mayoral candidate, and of course we did not win, but the entire council saw it fit that I be elected as a speaker. And that speaks volume to say being a one-seater party does not mean that you are a, a minority in your thinking. It just means that you resonate with different values that the majority does not. And there are certain people in our country that do resonate with that, and they would give you their vote to go and represent them. And that's what we are doing. We're representing those that feel they resonate with what we have to offer. And contrary to what the um, uh, gentleman Colin has said, um, I have not even unpacked what I have to offer. Yeah, we haven't even started that. We haven't so even let's, started. Let's be careful so, with that. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, when it comes to coalitions, will you, uh, your voters like what you are doing? All right, and that, and they are giving you the mandate if they do, and you get, let's say, one, two seats in parliament, which is fantastic. Will you change to fit a larger party to fit into a coalition, or it, this is what I do? You and and we will find coalition partners that fit within what we think. Uh, John, you know, uh, with much reflection, we've made those mistakes. I think even as coping the city of Joburg. 
trying to fit into the multi-party, you f- you then realize the DA has a different agenda mm. to what your constituency want. And then we try to fit into the government of local unity, realize that the ANC has no interest in governing but to get into the purse, and there's no interest really in, in saving our people. So at this stage, um, we want to represent our constituency to the best of our ability, even if it means that we're just going to sit in the opposition benches and push the policies that we want to push, um, we are prepared to do that. Because as I sit now, I don't see a coalition that we could fit into and be comfortable, except if all these um, new parties that are coming up, and I have a lot of respect for them. You know, if you get the rise, you, you get perhaps the action, you some get independence, some, some maybe? independence, we come together and we have votes enough to make government. I think mm. that's what South Africa needs, and it will bring a change in this country. But going with ANC and going with DA, nah. And Flantla, in Kwazulu Natal, hi. Uh, good afternoon, my brother, and, and to your Colleen. Um, but rather, uh, I've got a problem when they, with the press when she says she, she doesn't believe in uh, appropriation of the land. Uh, at the moment, we are having a bill that speaks about appropriation of the land. We are having a bill that speaks about equality, employment equity. And uh, when we speak about disputing the land, most of the women in rural areas they use the land, they plant, but they don't get support uh, to to plant and, uh, and be able to sell right, to cow. To, okay, to let's let's find out the reason, Slantla and Slantla and Kwazulu Natal. Uh, you you did say that I was going to bring that up on you uh, earlier, Colleen Makubele, president of South African Rainbow Alliance. Uh, one can one can survive with land. So what what is it? What is your land policy? What is your thinking? Um, let me correct the the, the um, listener, the gentleman who just called. Expropriation, we believe, but without compensation, it's just not possible with the constitution that we have. Okay. And if somebody comes to you and say, this is what we're going to give, it's our policy, um, believe me, they have not been able to do it for the last 30 years. They're not going to be able to do it unless they change the constitution of the land. You may enjoy being lied to and um, buy into a story that will never be possible. But what we are saying is this. We are not against people buying land, as the constitution says. We are not against giving a land which government has land and it gives to um, housing projects and etc to build houses they've given to rural areas because that land is controlled by the traditional leaders etc they give land to their um, uh, people and their citizens within that particular village and they can be able to cultivate we as a government of Sarah if we need to assist anyone to cultivate whether it's seeds or irrigation or water rights we are prepared to do that but we're not going to sit here and lie to you to say we're going to give you land without a uh, compensation we can't do that without having the ability to change the constitution we believe that people must be given those opportunities to um, income earning opportunities if it's through farming yes we'll assist you with that and we have it in the rural generation it's part of our uh, manifesto we've spoken about it and if we have time to get into it we'll get into it rural generation talks to agriculture as well how do we assist a um, our, our, our uh, rural mothers and fathers, young men and young women, to go back and regenerate the rural areas, create tourism exp- uh, 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 opportunities in there, because rural tourism, cultural tourism, ecotourism is big now. Uh, go into farming with the land that they have for food security and many other reasons. You'll find it in our policies. And we talk about jobs. When we tell you that what is important for South Africans right now, any South African that you meet on the road is income earning. They want to be able to have a income, money in their pocket, food on their table, and have a home. And having a home does not mean that you must expropriate land. It means that a government must be able to provide the homes that they said they will provide since 1994. And I want to say this, uh, 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 John, if you allow me. Uh, one of the key reasons that as Sarah we are here and we exist, this will answer the previous uh, caller's question as well. There are four primary tests of any legit 
a, a democratic government, if that government is able to provide, number one, income any opportunity for its citizen, mm -hmm. the government that we have has failed. Test number two, can that government provide homes for its citizens? This government has failed. We've got three million back, uh, backlog, three million homes of backlogs in South Africa that needs to be addressed because of the tender system, corruption, and some of this uh, EEE and BEE stuff that they apply to the tender uh, processes that they hide corruption under. And that is what we want to look into. Empowering transformation, empowerment is high on our agenda. But we think we need to fix something in there so that we empower the right people, not just ANC cadres and those connected to power. Three tests. Can this government protect its citizens domestically? This government has failed. The high level of crime, we are unsafe. We have to hide ourselves in our home because we just don't know whether you drive down the road, are you going to come back home alive or not? This government has failed to protect its citizens. The police okay. needs reform. Just, just before... The fourth and the last one. If yeah. We, yeah we, can this government protect its citizens from external threats, threats. through okay. its border controls yeah. and uh, the influx of immigrants? We don't even have to go to the foreign nationals. The government has failed on those four fundamental tests. And everybody who's standing on these elections is either standing on one of those or on all of those to be providing solutions. And ours are in our manifesto. Okay, so that's, that's my point. You're, you're criticizing what has been done. Can you make those changes? Well, well, your policies, and unfortunately we, can't, we don't have time to go through all of them, mm. but based on your policies, and I'm sure that you will share it with people on social medias and emails and all those kind of things, can you do those four things? Do Certainly. you feel you have the people and the talent to be able to do that? We have. You look at our candidate list, you'll see the kind of people that we've put in there. It talks to those priorities that we have. Let me talk about our Sara gear, um, which is what we've put in our manifesto That's as our headline. Phone. Yeah. yeah. G is for growth. How do we then uh, inspire and stimulate growth in South Africa to create those jobs or income or earning opportunities? Number one, we want to denationalize all the state-owned entities. There is no state-owned entity that is working in this country. We want to be able to get private investors to take over state-owned entities like Transnet, everything. Prasa, railway lines, roads, roads, everything. You don't have water. State is running that. Yes. You don't have electricity. State is running that. You, you name it. Post office is no longer working. You know, we are closing it down. We are retrenching over 100,000 people. We want to privatize people. everything. We have to privatize, but government working with private sector. SAA. We, we, it may have been a failed project because of the corruption of Godan, you know, to, to, to privatize it. But it has to be privatized. It was failing. They were retrenching many, many people. You name it, Denel. I, I can go on and on and tell you what is not working. Because those are already nationalized entities. This government is not able to effectively run Don't states. tell me what this government and, ca can't and do. Tell me what you can. Yes, we have people, we have investors that want to come and put in their money. Mm. And even when I was the chairperson of the post office, we had investors that wanted to come and say, you don't have to retrench anybody. We'll take over this infrastructure. We'll make it work. We like the footprint of post office. Mm. We've got ideas and we can even share the revenue with, with you guys. Brilliant ideas. But nobody wanted to buy into so, it. Now so, we are they're retrenching, they've closed it. So, so it's a public, public is private the, partnerships is what you're talking PPP about. PPP. Because that's, the, that's my worry. Issue. You can't have private people owning the railway line. No, you can't. But you need private sector to put in the money to, 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 to now uh, 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 modernize those railways, modernize our ports. We used to be number uh, top 10 of ports uh, around the world. Mm. Right now we are lingering 251st, 256th in the world because we don't even have the money to modernize them. So those uh, private partnerships are so crucial to make sure that we create jobs, we maintain you know, our status in the world as, you know, as a going into first world country, create efficiency so that the world can come. Trade unions, Number two, trade unions are going to hate you. Well, I, I'm not a fan of them a lot as well, but we have to put them in their place. They protect the rights of workers. They cannot yes. dictate on policy. And those are some of the firm leadership qualities that we're bringing. Because at the state where we are right now, if we continue in this trajectory, where trade unions feel the upper hand over government all the time, we are just going to lose the jobs. They are not gaining anything because all the people that should be in trade unions and working are sitting at home waiting for a grant every month. So it, it, it's like really let's just be sound in our minds 
Two, we want to introduce a 24-hour economy, night economy. Mm -hmm. We know nightlife in South Africa. And we compete with uh, metropolitan cities like New York and, and London, Hong Kong, Tokyo, etc. Those are night economies that are generating jobs three shifts in a day. They don't sleep. That's why they operate through time, time zones. Mm. Uh, on, our only night uh, economy that we know is hospitals and maybe restaurants and clubs. Right now, we're saying that offices can operate 24-7. Malls, shops can operate 24-7. You've created three shifts without lifting a finger. That alone halves the unemployment before we can even uh, breathe in our first 30 days in office. Sure. That can be implemented. Cutting down taxes for corporates. You know, uh, we are the highest, uh, one of the highest countries that tax corporates and SMMEs. If we remove those tax burdens mm. and as a condition create jobs, invest, modernize your equipment, assist us. Like South Africa used to be a workshop of the world. Right now we're an industrial wasteland because of some of these things that we're raising here. Colleen, we're, it's, it's officially six o'clock. Um, mm. Where can somebody find, I know I've been struggling to find your website. So I yeah. don't know if you have a website. So you've got a lovely 40-page manifesto. Where, how do we get hold of that? Yeah, we, we actually took it down because we're putting in a donate for us tab so that it can be interactive. <laughs> <laughs> so it should be coming up. Okay. You should see our website. Uh, if, if not in the next couple of days, it should be up again. We needed to revise because we need to raise money yeah. and we needed to put those functionalities. But you'll find it there in our social media. Contact us. Social we'll media is busy. Yeah. Yeah, and we will send it to you. It's 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 readily available. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Sara, S A R A. Yeah. Will that be where it is? All right. So that is Colleen Makubela. Unfortunately, we're out of time. President of the South African Rainbow Alliance. Touch the surface. We've just scratched it. Uh, it's now up to you to go and do a little bit more research. Colleen Makubela, thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, yeah. It's one minute past six. Thanks to the team. Thank you, John. In your top stories at six, Banye Mine announces sizable job cuts and former American football star O.J. Simpson dies at 76. This is SAFM News. A very good evening. I am Luanda Maume. Sibanye Stillwater has announced that the planned restructuring of its South African gold operations could result in the loss of over 4,000 jobs. The company stated that the restructuring was intended to stop losses at its Beatrix One shaft, which has been unable to provide expected production. The corporation suffered an annual loss of $2 billion in 2023 due to a collapse in metal prices. It is also looking to cut at its Clue of 2 plant, which after the closure of the Clue of 4 shaft during 2023, has had insufficient processing material available to cover overheads. Sibanya Stillwater spoke